BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Here's round one, try and test their vocabularies. Two marks if they can get the meaning of these words approximately right. We begin with Dillis Powell. Dillis, what is a hobble de hoy? Hobble and de and hoy. Hobble de hoy. It's a kind of awkward character. And yes. I think a hobble de hoy is a, um, a kind of boy who's rather awkward. Mm, that'll do. Awkward youth, midway between boyhood and manhood. Hobbledy hoyish being the kind of behaviour he's supposed to have. Dennis Norton, what is a dramaturge? D R A M A T U R G E. Dramaturge or dramaturge. You know what an urge is, Jack. <laughs> yes. Or if you don't know, perhaps you can remember. <laughs> a dramaturge is a man who has an urge to write a turgid drama. <laughs> um, playwright, dramatist. Quite right. It means, from the Greek, somebody who works in drama, just like a metallurgist is somebody who works in metal. Only it tougher. Anne Scott James, what is lentitude? L-E-N-T-I-T-U-D-E. Lentitude. L-E-N-T-I-T-U-D-E. N-T. N-T. Yes. Well, I should think it's slowness. Yes, you're absolutely right. Sluggishness or slowness from the Latin lentus, slow. Well done, two marks. Frank Muir, the meaning of the word twit. T-W-I-T. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Twit. <coughs> the Tunbridge Wells Institute of Tattooing. <laughs> it's the it's fifty percent of what an owl says. <laughs> um, to twit means to um, uh, to chaff. Yes. <laughs> I think that'll do. <laughs> I, I don't ask yes. for any more, I don't think. When I, when I walked in, all the chaps twitted me. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Yes, yes. yes, you've got your coat on backwards. <laughs> Upbraiding, reproaching or taunting somebody because of some mistake or some fault that he's made. Well, before we start the second round, I give each team a quotation and they write it down if they want. And I want the two women members of the team to study their quotations because at the end of the programme I shall ask them where those quotations come from. So, Dillis Power and Frank Muir, here's your quotation. Healing is a matter of time. Healing is a matter of time. And Anne Scott James and Dennis, yours is I dream of Jeannie with the light brown hair. And then at the end of the programme I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their ideas of how these quotations came to be spoken or written. Well, round two is a round of mythology. Two marks if you get these right. Lewis Powell, who seduced and abducted Helen of Troy, and what was the result? Paris. <laughs> Paris it is. And the result? All that war, Trojan. And the Iliad. Yes, and the Iliad, and lots of things. Quite right. Two marks. Dennis Norton, who used to swim the Hellespont every night to see whom? Uh, wait a minute, because they've got their names the wrong way round. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was Leander... Yes. ...who was the man in question, who used to swim it to see Hero, mm -hmm. who was the girl. I don't know why she was called... I think their parents must have wanted a boy. <laughs> um, and she used to hang a lamp from her battlements. Yes. <laughs> and, um... One night the light went out, <laughs> as it does. It was blown out by the wind. Lord Byron also swam the Hellas. Yeah, quite right, he yes. did, yes. Oh, well done. Two marks you get. Um, Leander, who lived at Abydos on one side of the Straits Dardanelles, um, had this uh, beloved called Hero. The girl who lived at Sestos in a tower, and there was, as Dennis says, this light lantern she hung up as a sort of guide light. And one night it was blown out by the wind, and he drowned, perished miserably, and she threw herself off her tower next morning when he didn't turn up, and was drowned too. Sad little story. And Scott James, 
What were the centaurs? C E N T A U R S. Centaurs. Well, the centaurs were half men and half beasts. Which half? Oh, the top half was men, mm. and the bottom half was horse, and they lived, I think, in Thessaly, if I remember right. Yes, quite right. And very wild packs of men beasts and uh, men horses they were. Mm. That'll do, I think, very well. Yes, this was a fabulous race of creatures who had horses four legs and most of the horse's body, but also on top of that, as it were, there was standing out in front was the human body and the arms and the head, um, and they were tended to be rather particularly fond of wine and women, and they were always fighting the surrounding tribes in consequence. They lived on Mount Pelia in Thessaly, two barks. Frank Muir, who was Pygmalion's sister? Pygmalion then murdered his sister's husband, and so she fled to North Africa, and there founded the city of Carthage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please may be excused. <laughs> It's Dido. been a funny kind yeah. of a day. Dido. 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 No, Dido is a thing that goes on the top of the wallpaper. <laughs> is it Dido? I think it's Dido. It's the Dido, Jack. Dido it is. She founded Carthage. Went, founded Carthage. One story is that she then killed herself because the rather tough barbarian king wanted to marry her. But later on, when Virgil wrote, um, she was supposed to have killed herself because her lover, Aeneas, ran away from her. Two marks. Well, the next round is <coughs> origins and derivations <coughs> of words and expressions and phrases. Um, three marks, if members of the team can first of all say what the present meaning is, and then give the origin or derivation. Beginning with Dillis Power, your word is spinster. Uh, a spinster means an unmarried woman. And originally? I think it's meant, meant somebody who spent her time spinning. But she what? had not a husband. She had to fill in the time somehow. <laughs> <laughs> That's all quite accurate as far as it goes, Dillis, but... Um, she didn't go uh, any further. Why was this important? I mean... <laughs> ah, she had to spin her trousseau. That's it. Absolutely right. Three marks it is. Uh, Spencer nowadays, a woman who is unmarried, but in early English times, the women in winter, there wasn't much else to do, spun the fleeces, which were taken from the sheep in summer, and it was a normal job, and as Dillis quite rightly says, no woman of that period was considered to be fit for marriage until she'd spun for herself the whole lot of uh, her own clothing and table and what we should call bed linen nowadays. And the job is usually given to the unmarried women of the household, spinners or spinsters. You find it in Twelfth Night, the spinsters and the knitters in the sun and the free maids that weave their thread with bones. Do used to sing it? Dennis Norton, all moonshine. Rather a lot of rubbish, nonsense. Um, yeah. Not to be believed. Yeah. Why? It means that there's not much shine from the moon, I think. Or, yes. Um, and therefore it's not to be trusted. Yes, and why isn't there much shine from the moon? Ah, now, that's... Um, well, because it's reflected um, it's, uh, it's, it's reflected, you bring in the ionosphere and Appleton, <laughs> <laughs> Appleton's lair and all that <laughs> stuff that I dozed during school hours. <laughs> um, all moonshine means something which is not the real thing, which is false. And the reason is that moonshine itself is not the real thing because the moon doesn't shine at all. It only reflects the light of the sun. And so an incredible statement, coming at second hand, as it were, is said to be a lot of moonshine. And Scott James, he's shot his boat. He shot his bolt, it means he's produced all he's going to produce. Mm -hmm. He's had it. Mm -hmm. His effort is spent. Yes. And now, originally? a bolt, as we all know, is a very early form of medieval arrow. Oh, it's the last arrow in the quiver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when he shot the bolt, which, as we all so ask toxophilists know, yes. is the um, uh, last arrow in the quiver, then he has nothing left to shoot with. Good enough, as um, Anne quite rightly says, when Chappard got rid of all his bolts. Uh, it meant that uh, he couldn't uh, attack or counterattack anymore, and he was finished. Now, back to Frank Muir. Sardonic smile or sardonic laughter? A sardonic smile means a kind of ironic smile. Yes. And uh, it's connected with Sardinia. Yes. Because in Sardinia, the type of maquis 
which is uh, rather like alum. And when you eat it, it makes you go... Mm, 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 and sort of shrinks up your face. Yes, that'll do. Three marks. Um, a mocking smile, n- not expressing any real merriment. And uh, Frank is quite right. Uh, it's a word sardonius, first used by Homer, and probably referred to this poisonous plant which grew in Sardinia, or may still grow there, I don't know. And those who ate it certainly grinned very widely, but normally died immediately afterwards. Convulsive laughter ending in death. As a matter of fact, the um, derivation is a bit dubious. It may simply, quite simply come from the Greek word sarai, meaning to grin. Well, the next round is the who, why, and what department. Two marks again, if they get them right. Dearest Powell, who wrote about what? That it was a grain which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. Porridge, oats. oats. Yes, oats, and by whom? Um, Said by, sounds like Johnson. Yes, it was. Dr Johnson. Quite right. Samuel Johnson, in his dictionary definition of the word oats, said this, a grain which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. And he realised afterwards he had been a bit naughty in that definition and said, I own that by my definition of oats, I meant to vex them. That is, the Scots. He was always trying to vex the Scots. Two marks. Dennis Norton, in what book by what author does the character Mr Scaramanga appear? Oh, wait a minute. That's, that's the last Ian Fleming book. Yes. Title? The man with the golden thingamajig. Um, the man with the golden gun. Quite right. Rather second-rate sort of villain, actually. Scaramanga is, I think, the man with the golden gun himself and is the villain of the piece. Two marks. And Scott James, who wrote of what when he wrote these words? It is the only art in which the artist is in danger of death and in which the degree of brilliance in the performance is left to the fighter's honour. I say. Mm. Bullfighting? Yes. And by? Hemingway? Yes, quite right. Two marks, you get it. Ernest (laughs) Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway, talking of bullfighting in his book, Death in the Afternoon. Frank Noah. It ennobled our hearts and enriched our blood. Our soldiers were brave and our courtiers were good. Beer? No. <laughs> More solid than beer. Beef? 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 Yes. Beef. Which, which beef? Which beef? Which beef? <laughs> well, you know, the bull. <laughs> oh. We've just killed is naturally slaughtered. English beef. The, friend, roast, the roast beef roast of beef, old yes. England. Yes, of course. Of Your friend Henry Fielding came into this. It was the roast beef of old England. Richard Leveridge, in the 18th century, wrote these particular lines I've quoted. It ennobled our hearts and enriched our blood. Our soldiers were brave and our courtiers were not good, but good. But Henry Fielding in the Grub Street Opera uh, says much the same thing. Oh, the roast beef of old England, and oh, the old English roast beef. Now, the next round refers to our experiences when we travel on the continent. For two marks, what do the following mean? Tillis Powell, prosciutto. P-R-O-S-C-I-U-T-T-O. It's a kind of ham. And what kind of ham? It's kind of... It's, it's not cooked ham. It isn't sort of boiled. No. What is you done eat it, it with melon or with figs. But what is done to it before... You don't eat it absolutely raw. Cured. Yes. What smoked it, ham. What's wrong with it? Prosciutto <laughs> ah. <laughs> is Italian smoked ham, sometimes called Parma ham, and sometimes eaten with melon. Too much. Dennis Norton, Bel Paese. Cheese. Colour? Well, it's a sort of <laughs> creamy mm-hmm. white. Yeah. And they give you great dollops of it. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right. A mild and creamy Italian white cheese. Two marks. And Scott James. Assiette anglaise. Ah. Oh, mm. It's uh, one of those yummy mixtures of cold meats, I think. That's right. It simply, in French, means, means a plate of assorted cold meats, which is presumably supposed to be the only thing that the English will eat. It's really, yeah. yes, yeah. when you just sling a bit of ham and tongue at your guests. That's right. You call it assiette en glaise. Um, Frank Muir, Wiener Schnitzel. This is a hot meal. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like a half a leather wallet. <laughs> <laughs> 
which is, which is dusted with fried sawdust, <laughs> and on top of two slices of Lot's wife, <laughs> arranged diagonally, and, and a dead olive. <laughs> and it's all, it's all fried in, in some oil. And I believe uh, originally um, from Vienna. <laughs> if, it's if it's Holstein, it's, it's got a tired uh, egg on it. <laughs> If you think they're going to let you cross the Austrian border after this frack, <laughs> great mistake. But I'm bound to give you your marks, even if your uh, comments were uh, not very nice. A thin veal cutlet coated with egg and breadcrumbs, fried and garnished with lemon, anchovies, and stoned olives, and comes from Vienna. And now we come to the last round and go back to the quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the program. So for two marks, Dillis Power, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Healing is a matter of time. Um, some medical gentleman. Yes. Uh, a classical medical gentleman. Classical medical gentleman. Um, Esculapius, Hippocrates. Yes, well, you better stick to the men and not the god. Oh, Hippocrates, then. Quite right. Hippocrates, the great Greek physician, who said healing is a matter of time, and he went on to say, but it's sometimes also a matter of opportunity. Two marks. Anne Scott James, the origin of your quotation... I dream of Jeannie with the light brown hair. Well, I think that's a jolly old song. Yes, it's a jolly old song. Uh, which Dennis will now uh, sing you the tune. <laughs> Not without my group. <laughs> <coughs> Stephen Foster, I believe. Yes, you're quite right. Two marks. Well, now I shall ask uh, Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Frank Muir and his quotation, healing is a matter of time. When I was young, I was known as Feckless Frank, the maddest madcap of all our crowd. <laughs> it's funny, you know, that the, my old chums... They asked me how, after that zany, mad, mad time we had in Buckinghamshire, how, <laughs> how I could possibly live in a dull West London suburb. And we were, we were crazy. <laughs> we just didn't know what we were going to do next when we were young in a village. Do you know Aylesbury? <laughs> well, it was about um, a little village about six miles southwest of Aylesbury in a hollow called T-H-A-M-E, Tame. I lived with my aunt there, in between the two hills. It was a mad, mad, mad wield. <laughs> so lots of us in the gang. Um, there was Angela Moore Thaxton, and I was rather keen on her. <laughs> and there was uh, Colin Watts Watts. And uh, there was Elspeth Longbottom, <laughs> a tall girl. And there was a... <clears throat> And my charm, Hugo Willoughby Gotch. Um, rather curious chap, but his mother was a fellow. Uh, <laughs> the zoo, I think. Anyway, we all... Um, <laughs> fellow zoo, I mean, we all had... We were so crazy in this village. It really was so exciting. There was always something going on. We used to play games, these mad, mad games, like uh, we'd have um, a competition as to who would... which of the chaps would pull most pigtails in a day. You know, and I won, I, I pulled 17, you know. I just didn't care. Some of them, big pigs, some of them, too. <laughs> and uh, we used to have mad things like, like uh, champagne suppers. And then came the day that uh, Auntie, Auntie died. Um, I, I, I couldn't stay in my mad, mad, wonderful tame. And I, I moved and took a, a bachelor flat just at the back of the parade in West Ealing. Nowhere near the common, of course. <laughs> and uh, I kept up my rugger. We all had the scarves, you know, and we watched the game on television, and then we all went round to the pub and whistled dirty songs in the saloon <laughs> bar. We just didn't care what we did. It was really a terribly exciting time, and I suddenly realised that, that I was having a fuller life, even. My whole life was becoming gayer and more exciting. And when people say... How could you leave mad, mad Buckinghamshire for a London suburb? I say, but it's even better if you're in with the right crowd. In fact, if you are in with the right crowd, in the words of Hippocrates, 
Ealing as a Madua tame. <laughs> Ritz will be served tomorrow by the mayor and the chairman of the rural district council, but never mind. We'll go on to Dennis Norton. And if you remember his... It's on you, it's urban <laughs> district council. <laughs> we'll go on to Dennis Norton. And if you remember, his quotation was, I dream of Jeannie with the light brown hair. Every step of that terrible journey, I kept saying to myself, what are you? the most timid introvert of people doing walking across London on a crowded Sunday afternoon clad only in a short Japanese kimono with a dragon on the back why are you doing this and then I answered myself it's because of this urge of yours to be with it which was exactly the reason why it happened the the previous week I'd been taken to a discotheque for the first time. This, this, these cellars where they put on records of beat music and all the younger smart people twitch and shake. And I suddenly realized I was the only man there in plus fours. <laughs> Everybody else was wearing jeans. And that's what I must get. So the following Saturday morning I went to this mecca of contemporary masculine styling called Carnaby Street and the assistant approached me with the shaggiest head of hair I've ever seen outside of a yak. <laughs> um, but um, this, this very shaggy young man said, what would you like, sir? And I said, I'd like a pair of jeans. And he said, what colour, sir? And I said, well, you know, I'm not really particular. You know, what's, what's all the go now? What's all the rage? And he said, well, what they're wearing, what the chaps are wearing is fawn at the moment, very, very sort of light brown. I said, well, they're there. So he fetched them out for me, and I tried them on. Now, I must point out to the vast unseen audience that I'm um, very tall, and I have terribly skinny legs <laughs> from the waist down, the sort of in silhouette. <laughs> It's rather like a wishbone, you know, <laughs> and that these jeans sort of hung around each shank in folds, rather like a sort of draped flag, which wasn't the effect I'd seen at all at the discotheque. And I said, these don't fit, do they? So he said, no, well, that's all right. He said, what you do is you shrink them. So I said, well, how do you shrink them? He said, you go and lay in the bath for two hours <laughs> with them on. <laughs> I said, really, all right. So I went straight back home and I laid in the bath for two hours and I got up and looked and there was absolutely no change at all. So I went <laughs> straight back to the shop and I looked out this young Harry and I said, um, no change at all. And he was very surprised and he said, what temperature was the water? And I said, water. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I went, I went back again. I went back again, and I, um, and I filled up the bath, and it was marvellous. It really was. They were absolutely moulded to me. And I thought, great, well, I'll take them off, and I'll put them in the oven to dry, and, <laughs> you know, they'll be ready for the next night out. And I went to take them off. Now, that's where the trouble started, <laughs> because <clears throat> on these kind of jeans, the only means of entrance and exit is by means of a zip down the front, which is made of metal. <laughs> now, you don't have to be all that scientific to know the effect of two hours immersion in water on cheap metal. <laughs> Rusted. <laughs> Solid. I couldn't move at all. Couldn't get out of them in any way. And as you can imagine, I didn't pass a very comfortable night that <laughs> night. Well, first thing Sunday morning, I called a cab and I went to the outpatients department of St. George's Hospital. <laughs> and I said, could you possibly get me out of these? Well, they were terribly nice about it. Apparently, get, they get about ten cases a day, <laughs> it appears. And they sent for a skin specialist and he used one of these electric scalpels and I was rid of them except I'd neglected to bring a spare pair of trousers <laughs> with me. So I said, 
could you possibly let me have a pair of trousers to go back home in? And he said, not on the national health. <laughs> well, I don't know what I've done. If it hadn't been for this um, nice nurse who said, well, we do have some clothes here from the Hospital Amateur Dramatic Society's next production. Well, as you've guessed, that was the Mikado. <laughs> that was why I found myself walking across London on a Sunday afternoon in this short Japanese kimono with a dragon on the back. It's an experience I shall never forget. And for the rest of my life, I shall wake up twitching and sweating whenever I dream of Harry with the light brown jeans. <laughs> I think Dennis had a very lucky escape. And by your vote, he wins the contest of the two stories. And that brings us to a final score in which Dennis and Anne Scott James win by one mark from Dillis Powell and Frank Muir. And it also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words. And this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute in London. And those taking part are Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Dennis Norton and Frank Muir. And here's round one to try and test their extensive vocabularies. Two marks, if they can give me the meaning of these words approximately right. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Dillis, what is a solatium? S-O-L-A-T-I-U-M, solatium. It's something to do with a kind of sol... If you take the end off, it becomes a kind of solace. Yes, it would. A kind of compensation. Yes. Is compensation right? is all right. Compensation. Money. Money. Yes, that'll do. Yes. I'm Too money. money. If you run down if a you... bearded ancient on your bicycle and offer him <laughs> sixpence, that would be a very, very small solution. Ah. For trouble incurred or injury mm. uh, sustained. Dennis Norton, mm. what is a wowser? W-O-W-S-E-R. Wowser. Well, that's a very appropriate Commonwealth word. Yes. The Commonwealth. It's an Australian slang word. Yes. Um, meaning uh, Mrs. Grundy or a... Somebody who blushes if they see a naked light. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who's, who's over-puritanical. Absolutely right. Anne Scott James, what is a widgeon? W-I-D-G-E-O-N. Widgeon. Oh, you cook it and shoot it and eat it. Not in that order. order. Shoot it, cook it and eat it. It's a kind of a little game bird, a little duck. Yes, that's fair enough. Two marks. Frank Muir, what is a port fire? Is it the the train of powder between the the pan of a flint pistol or a cannon and the actual mass of gunpowder gun which projects the ball there forth. Yeah, that would do. 
Well, that's Fair. fine then. Don't I think yes, I, I think I'll give it to you for that. Um, you've got one use of it. Um, it's a way of igniting explosives in mines and quarries and things. Is it an early to an early a port fire? Is it an early signal firework? That's right. Yes, you've got both halves. Well done. Two marks. One way is uh, igniting explosives for quarrying and so on by a slow-burning fuse. The other is a case or device filled with explosives for firing signal rockets. <laughs> Two marks. <laughs> Well, before we start round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I want the two women members of the team to go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme I shall ask them where the quotations come from. Uh, Doris Powell and Frank Muir, here's your quotation. Half a loaf is better than no bread. And Anne Scott James and Dennis, here's yours. But those behind cried forward, and those before cried back. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Well, so on to round two, and this is a round of mythology. For two marks, I want you to say what you know of the following people or things. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Dillis Powell, who was Helios? Helios? He was the sun, wasn't he? Yes, sun... Uh, no, that kind of mm. sound. Yeah, yeah, sun was, up in the sky. Yes, not a... And he was a... He was a god. Yes, that's what I wanted. Um, do you remember how he got around? He got around <coughs> in the sky. <clears throat> yes, but how? Well, he, he'd learnt astronomy rather early. <laughs> <laughs> sort of... He got around very quickly. He had a car. He had a kind that's of it, chariot. Yeah. That's it, absolutely. Drawn right. by... Well, we won't get... Don't let's go any further. I should get it wrong. That, that's all right. You've got your two marks. He's the Greek sun god, the son of the Titan Hyperion, and every morning, punctually, he got up from a splendid palace in the east and was drawn in a golden chariot across the sky by four milk-white horses and then dropped down in his second palace right in the west and then went chugging back all night long in a boat, a golden boat, right round the north, because they didn't think the earth was round. Two marks. Dennis Norton, who and what was chaos? It was the god who looked after all the emptiness before <laughs> the they started emptiness. the building, you know. Yeah, mm. that's absolutely All the emptiness, yeah. Mm. And a little. A void. <laughs> he used Come to play, play a game called My Void. <laughs> 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 yes, the oldest thing created, or he, uh, some people say he was a god, it was the formless void from which the universe was created and the first of all existing things. And Scott James, who were the... Listrigones or Listrigonians? L A E S T R Y G O N E S. Listrigones. Now, Odysseus came in contact yes, with did. them in one of the islands. Quite right. And they were enormous, I think. Yes. They were giants. Uh -huh. And they had rather nasty habits. Now, what on earth did they do? Um... You're asking me to select one <laughs> nasty <laughs> habit rather than. <laughs> 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 Now, they weren't know. as bad as the Cyclopses. What? They weren't as bad as the Cyclopses, actually. I'm glad <laughs> the that they oh, moved out. They broke out people's and, bones, you know. They yes. mashed them up. They yes, they people, did. Mash is the right... They mashed up the people who were wrecked on their island. Mash is the right word. What do you do with mash? Grind. Put sausage with it. That's right. <laughs> and they ate it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I helped you a bit. One and a half. Oh, you didn't help at all. Uh, yeah, two. You, you were a hindrance, if anything. Yeah. In uh, Homer, they were a race of cannibal giants, and originally, in his account, they lived in the distant north, where the nights are so short that the shepherd driving his flock out meets the shepherd who is driving his flock in. And um, Odysseus, or Ulysses, landed on the island with two men, and the king of the Listrigonians ate one of them just to show what he was capable of and sent the other one back. And then they, he pelted the Ulysses' ship with rocks and they only got off with great difficulty. One and a half. Frank Muir, who was Terminus? Oh, he was the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <That's>... You're right. <laughs> That's about half the answer. He was a Roman god. Yes. He was the god of... Um... You bought a little property in Corsica. Ah, How yes. do you know? It's oh, um, because I have the uh, boundaries. That's it. God of boundaries. The <laughs> god of boundaries. <laughs> One and a half again, because I did do, give some help. <laughs> he was the Roman god of boundaries and frontiers, and he very specially protected the boundary marks, the stones with which, before hedges, 
uh, you did mark the boundaries of your property. And if anybody pulled them up, he became an outlaw and you could sort of shoot him on sight. The next round's about rhyming slang. Now, rhyming slang is perhaps not used as much as it was, but it has some pretty colourful expressions in it. Two marks if you get the meanings of these bits of slang right. Dillis Powell, a Joanna. Piano. <laughs> Quite right, a piano, or piano. Um, Dennis Norton, Kate and Sydney. Steak and kidney. Yes, pie or pudding. <laughs> steak and kidney, steak and kidney, pie or pudding. Steak and kidney, pie. <laughs> yes, I would go for that yeah. too. I think it's either, probably. <laughs> Two marks. Anne Scott James, rabbit and pork. Well, it's rabbit, eh? talk, chatter. <laughs> That's right. Rabbit and pork is talk. And usually now it's to rabbit. He goes rabbiting on and on and on. Mm. Too much. Frank Muir. Scarpa flow. Scarpa flow, go. Yes. <laughs> uh, usually scarper now. He's scarpered uh, to go or to escape. Well done. Everybody's got everything right. Yeah, well, we're all right at illiteracy, you see. It's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to the next round, and this is origins and derivations of phrases. Um, three marks altogether, if the team can define the present meaning of the phrase and then say the origin of it, what it originally meant and came from. Beginning with Dillis Powell, to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Um, present meaning first. Present meaning... Um... Well, it means if, if you um, accept some... Well, what does Do it mean, for goodness sake? Doesn't it mean, uh, um, doesn't it mean to be preoccupied with uh, minute details yeah. and miss hmm. the larger issue? That's Brilliant. Right. Dear mm. Frank. That's, yes. that's the way in which I've never employed the phrase, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that's, that's good enough for the modern meaning. And coming from... Old Testament. No. New Testament. Yes. Um, present meaning of to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel would be to make a fuss about something very small and then um, pass over something very much more important without mention at all. comes from St. Matthew's Gospel. Christ has been upbraiding the scribes and Pharisees for their hypocrisy in concentrating on tiny things and leaving undone the big things like law and judgment and mercy and faith. And he says, ye blind guides which strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. It's straining out rather than straining at. It's been a bit mistranslated. <laughs> One and a half out of three. Dennis Norden on his uppers. Well, it means um, impecunious, short of money, or the Greek word skint, <laughs> 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 which, uh, yes, and it probably comes from... Um, from shoes, and it means that, that you're down at heel. You've got no, you've got nothing below. But you've only got the uppers. I never know how people could wear them like that. <laughs> I quite agree. It's like upside down <laughs> sandals. Really, <isn't> it? <laughs> nothing on. You know. You're dead right. You get your three marks. Someone down in his luck and no money. And uh, if you are in that state, you, it's difficult to afford to have your shoes soled and heeled. And so they wear down at the heels and wear through in the soles. And so you're more or less walking on your uppers. But just how you do it, I agree with Dennis. I don't mm. know. <laughs> Three marks. Anne Scott James, as pleased as punch. Well, just delighted, hilarious, happy. Mm -hmm. Means you're as pleased as Mr. Punch, who's yes. a sort of um, a famous figure of the Harlequinade, or not yes. the Harlequinade, a famous comic figure. It's what happens in Punch and Judy. Ah, that's it. It is the horror story of all time. Yes, actually. isn't it? It's sadistic. Children are eaten by crocodiles and banged on the head. Banged on the head, and he's pleased because he's got this grin painted on. He and can't he's done his wife color. in. Yeah. That's why he's pleased. Yeah. Pleased his wife means you've really <laughs> right. done Judy down. Before we get any further horrors, we'll give you your three marks. <laughs> Please, as punch means very pleased indeed, and it is punch of the Punch and Judy show, and throughout the whole of the play. He never stops praising himself and telling his audience how clever he is and uh, how pleased he is about all his wickedness and all his horrible tricks. And so, um, more than anybody else in the world, almost, Mr. Punch is very, very pleased with himself indeed. Frank Muir, to show one's true colours, or to show yourself in your true colours? It means to let slip the mask of, of civilised charm. And... <laughs> And reveal the sort of horrid person you really are. Yes. And from what does it come? 
comes from <clears throat> the 16th and, century, 16th and 17th century privateers who plied the oceans, the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, and they used to sail up to... They also had a box full of flags of all nations, if they carried, <laughs> and they used to run up... A, when they sighted a ship, they used to run up a, a similar flag so that the ship would allow them near, and they'd wave cheerily at them. When they got close, they would strike the colours of the vessel they're going to um, take over and run up their own colours, which was usually scarlet or black or the skull and crossbones. <laughs> End of lecture. That is such a perfect description that I can't beat it in any way, and I award you three marks without hesitation. <laughs> Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier on in the program. For two marks, Lewis Powell, can you give me the origin of the quotation, half a loaf is better than no bread? It's a proverb. Yes, by? Anonymous. Half a mark, because I think it probably was anonymous before he picked it up. It was John Haywood in 1546. Oh. Oh. Throw no gift at the giver's head. Better is half a loaf than no bread. Well, now, Anne Scott James, origin of your quotation, which was, and those behind cried forward, and those before cried back. This is the ranks of Tuscany poem, isn't yes. it? Yes. Um, how Horatius kept the bridge. Yes. Macaulay. Macaulay. Two marks it is. And now I ask Dennis and Frank to tell me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever unlikely explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, first of all, back to Frank Muir with his quotation, half a loaf is better than no bread. The other evening I was at home, sitting in my winged chair, leafing through my first editions. I always buy the first editions of the evening papers. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I was leafing through my first editions, and my son came in, and switched on the television and said, Father, this is quite surprising, because until he's 13, until quite recently, he called me Mother. <laughs> um, we believe in breaking these things gently to children. <laughs> he said, Father, could you tell me how a chap can attract a girl? And I said to him, Yes, son. Uh, because of my own experience with women, which goes back a number of years, I think really the solution is in that famous old proverb, which Hayward probably uh, uh, pinched and put in his book, John Hayward, which is, um, half a loaf is better than no bread. Um, so then I told him the story. It only takes five minutes. Our set, actually, our television set, takes five minutes to warm up. Most people take about 30 seconds. Ours takes five minutes because the electricity leaks out of the wire. <laughs> like a gas pipe. I think ours is the only television that does it, but it actually leaks out. So it takes six minutes to or five minutes to warm up. And at the end, the little white dot stays and dances about like Tinkerbell. <laughs> One evening we said, I do believe in fairies, I do believe in fairies, and the picture came back. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't sleep for a week. I said, my son, <clears throat> the first girlfriend... I had was when I was about your age. It was when I lived at, at Broadstairs. Her name was Clocker Attercliffe. At least we called her, her name was Attercliffe, but we called her Clocker, the chaps and I, because her father had a clock shop halfway up Broadstairs High Street. I loved that girl. I loved her passionately. But I never got, I couldn't summon enough courage to speak to her because she had no eyes for me. I used to watch her from afar. I observed her closely and saw her interest centred on A the deck chair attendant, B, the ice cream salesman, and C, her attention was really riveted on the bandsman who used to play, used to walk along the beach on their way to the bandstand. In those days, they had these little military bands which played on top. And suddenly I realised the answer to a woman's heart lay in wearing a uniform. Not in a uniform, but the, obviously the gayer the uniform, the more she was attracted. They had the green Howards on then, and they had gold braid all over them, befrogged across the front, even the clarinetist, and gold braid across their hat. At night I laid a plan. I went, I had a green suit, you see, and I went home, 
I thought, how to get some braid? I, one had, hadn't these things in those days. One doesn't have braid around the house. And I saw, in the corner of the bath, a loofah. I realised by tearing the loofah in half and teasing out strips of it and sticking it on with that paste we used to have in those days which smelt of, smelt of cyanide and then colouring it with the yolk of a soft-boiled egg. <laughs> I emulated, on my green suit, a befrogged Green Howard bandsman. So I borrowed a peaked cap from the milkman and I stuck more eggy loofah on the, t on the peak of the cap strolled past Clocker Attercliffe and said, excuse me, miss, her eyes started from her head. In a flash, I suddenly realised that she was in fact a very fat girl and very silly girl and she had a very poor complexion, rather like simmering porridge. <laughs> so I, <clears throat> and I never saw her again. But there's a sequel to this story. Just after the war, I was going through a trunk of old things and I suddenly found the other half of that loofah. And I suddenly realised that in that odd 15 years, I'd grown up, I was now about 25, 27, and I, I'd never been nearer than three foot to a girl since Clocker Attercliffe. <laughs> I realised I really must stir myself. And I realised the answer. I, I, looked, I looked at this half a crumpled loofah in the bottom of my trunk and eagerly I got out my RAF leading aircraftsman uniform. Eagerly I tore the loofah into strips, gummed it on to make a group captain's <laughs> golden braid. Eagerly I got my peaked cap for marching and glued a group captain's gold on the top. I painted it with gold paint. We had gold paint in those days. And out in the street I went towards the Hammersmith Palais. Five yards on, a lady policewoman put the half Nelson on me and arrested me for wearing an officer's uniform without permission. <laughs> well, on the way to the station, I fell in love with that girl and we were married and we've lived happily ever since, <laughs> son. So, if you ask me the way to a lady's heart, I say the answer is a uniform with plenty of gold braid on it. And if you aren't entitled to that uniform, then improvise. Don't forget... As the old saying is, half a loofah is better than no braid. <laughs> I don't know what Frank is going to go home and say to his very nice wife, Polly, this evening, but he'll perhaps find a way. And now back to uh, Dennis Norton. And if you remember, his quotation was, and those behind cried forward, and those before cried back. This summer, I was sitting in a little village in the middle of France, in a little cafe, eating chicken a la Ferrari. <laughs> which is chicken which has been run over by an Italian sports <laughs> um, Because it really was a very small village in a very bad cafe. And at the next table, I noticed a man staring very keenly at the waitress. And he bent forward and started drawing on the tablecloth. And what he was drawing was a woman's dress. And as I saw the dress, I suddenly realized who he is. Francois Le Truc. Now, don't act like you've never heard. <laughs> I mean, this is possibly France's leading dress designer. And so, of course, naturally, I introduced myself and I asked him what he was doing. And he said, I'm designing the pièce de résistance of my new autumn collection. Instantly, that's as much French as you get. We've now finished the French part of it. <laughs> and I said, you mean that for this coming autumn, this will be the dress which will set the fashion? And he said, yes. Now, I got very interested in that because <clears throat> I often thought, how much weirder can women's clothes get? 
you know, we've had topless dresses and we've had sort of the waist up somewhere around the neck and we've got these sort of mesh stockings that make women's legs look like they're tattooed and these kind of heels that give your lino the appearance of a cribbage board. You know? <laughs> and I said, surely there's no further than you can go. You can go now than you've been. And he said, oh, yes, there is. He said, you see, dress designing has always had the limitation of the actual geography of the feminine physique. He said, that is a barrier that nobody has crossed. He said, I have crossed it with my autumn collection. I said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm doing something entirely original and startling with the bust. So I said, you're raising it? So he said, no. He said, I said, you're lowering it? He said, no. I said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm shifting it round to the back. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I mean, exactly, I felt ex <laughs> My... My eyebrows went up beyond my widow's peak. You know, it, I said, it's impossible. And he showed me the dress that he'd drawn, absolutely straight in front, and with a zipper, a little zipper that did up. And at the back, the top was sort of pouched <laughs> and darted. And there was a little diamond clip just above where the left shoulder blade would come. <laughs> I said, they'll never wear that. He said, they'll wear anything once they get used to it. <laughs> I said, but they can't, they can't sort of physically accommodate it. <laughs> he said, they'll force themselves. <laughs> and I realized that they would. <laughs> they would. And so I waited for the autumn collections. Well, as you know now, it didn't happen. It wasn't in the papers. I, I was so intrigued, I rang him up. And I said, what about the shift round? The... <laughs> he said, the idiot model girl. I said, what? He said, she put it on back to front. <laughs> so I said, what a dreadful disappointment it must have been for you. He said, not at all. He said, it gives me another year to think about it. He said, and next year I shall be bringing it out plus an alteration. So I said, what? He said, you know the seat of a dress? I said, yeah. I said, you're not going to... He said, yes. <laughs> I tell this story so that all the ladies listening may anticipate what is going to happen and what you are going to be obliged to do next autumn all your physical features are going to be rearranged <laughs> those behind tried forward those in front tried back <laughs> That's an appalling glimpse of the future, and I, for one, believe it implicitly. And by your vote, Dennis Norton wins the contest of the stories. He and his partner, Anne Scott James, finally win the entire contest by three marks. And that brings also to an end this edition of My Word. In my word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.
BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words. And this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute. And those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton. Here's round one to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they can get the meaning of these words approximately right. Beginning with Anne Scott James... Anne, what is A or Anne, and I'm never quite certain which, what is a ewer, E-W-E-R? Oh, those lovely old-fashioned um, washstands that one gets in country pubs, inns, I mean. It's the basin part, the jug part. That's better. The jug, <laughs> the jug part of a jug and basin. That's right. Two marks well done. You notice that in the Commonwealth Institute, Jack will ask, what is a ewer? But in the pub round the corner, he never says, what's yours? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad this question was in the singular. It was easier. a song about it, isn't it? <laughs> it must be. Night yes. and day, you, you were the, the one. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to Frank Muir. And yours is rather harder, I think, Frank. Don't okay. care. What is or was a Clarence? A what? A Clarence. Clarence? When I was young, it was, um, was sometimes called a mother's boy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, it's also a, um, a carriage. Yes. Early Victorian and a town carriage. Yes. Um, I'll give you and a, a horse in front. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that's good enough. It's a four-wheeled, closed carriage with seats for four inside and two outside on the box, and it was named after the Duke of Clarence, who afterwards became the Sailor King, William IV. Two marks, well done. Doris Powell, what is a clavicle? Uh, a bone. Yes, which one? Um, collar bone. Absolutely right, two marks it is. Dennis Norton, what is a heptad? Well, hep... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it could be a rather sort of switched-on tadpole. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> or hep means seven. It couldn't conceivably yeah. be a seven-sided tap. tap. <laughs> <laughs> well, there wouldn't be room in the pond. <laughs> <laughs> stick to the seven idea, that's all right. Well, it's something seven, something, a, a group of seven. Yes, hello. Se that's good. Yes, well done. Oh. It's <laughs> a set or a group of seven, the... What, what was that film? There was a film about them. Seven the Magnificent Com Seven. The yeah. Magnificent Seven. That would be a hip, Dad. The Greek <laughs> uh, for seven. Well, before we start round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and the two women members of the team will, I hope, go on studying those quotations during the programme, because at the end, I shall ask them the source of the two quotations. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, first of all, your quotation is, Let them eat cake. And Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is, you left behind a broken doll. And at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. And so to the second round, which is about classical mythology. Mm. Two marks, if you get the answers reasonably right. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Anne, who was Nemesis? Well, Nemesis was fate which overtook you, inescapably and unavoidably. Um, not quite, Anne. I mean, it, it contains that. It was retribution. Certain. That's it. For whatever you had done. Not whatever you had done. Um, no. Suppose you're a king. Or a queen. Nemesis was the ace. <laughs> <laughs> That's just about it. <laughs> I thought it was retribution for your sins. Uh, yes. Uh, why does a king get more affected by if you were particularly, than anybody else? Well, you were A, fortunate, and if you were particularly arrogant or cocky... You mean it's the result of hubris? It's the result of hubris. Yeah. If you were like that, then Nemesis came and sorted you out yeah. pretty rapidly. Yeah. And so that uh, Nemesis, as a goddess, both in Greece and in Rome, was divine retributive justice coming and sorting you out afterwards. Two marks. 
Bank Muir, who was Boreas, B-O-R-E-A-S, Boreas. Um, what do you... Wind. Wind? Wind? <laughs> uh, we think North yes. Wind. You, uh, you, what you both think is absolutely dead right. Boreas was the North Wind, a god who was the son of Astrea, and his brothers were the other winds, uh, and he was said to have helped the Athenians in their war against the Persians by blowing very hard and destroying the Persian fleet. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> now, Dillis Bow. Dillis, who was Isculapius or Asclepius? Isculapius was a kind of semi-divine character who was concerned with medicine. Yes. And became, after being semi-divine... Well, he became really divine. Yes, he and then became the god went of... Went on, of healing. Yes, absolutely right. Two marks it is. He was a Greek god to start with, son of Apollo, and you sacrificed to him when you recovered, if you did recover, which was rather rarely, and you sacrificed a cock to Aesculapius, hence the phrase. He also is usually pictured with a serpent because he once went and saved the Romans when they had a frightful plague, and he appeared, rather unusually, in the shape of a serpent, hence the badge of the Royal Army Medical Corps. Dennis Norden, who was Cassiopeia? I haven't the faintest idea. <laughs> well, somebody or other set her up in the heavens, didn't yes, they? Sir. It was a constellation of Cassiopeia. Yes. I think uh, she fell into the sea and was picked up and put into the sky. I can We're make going you, too fast, Tommy. I can make you a star, he said. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, one out of two for partial accuracy and sheer ingenuity. She was the wife of Cepheus, who was king of Ethiopia, and she was the beautiful mother of a girl called Andromeda, and the mum, Cassiopeia, boasted that she was as beautiful as the sea nymphs, and that made Neptune or Poseidon very cross, and he sent a sea monster, and the only way you'd get rid of the sea monster, which ate ev everybody, was to sacrifice the daughter Andromeda to the sea monster. But she was saved at the last moment by Perseus, and then both of them were put, and here they're quite right, up into the sky as constellations, one Andromeda and the other one Yes, you appear. One out of two. Well, the next round is verse and poetry. Mm. I give each member of each team a quotation and ask them for the following line or lines. Two marks if they can finish off the quotation and two more if they can name the author the poem it comes from. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Oh, where and oh, where is your Highland laddie gone? And Dennis, you know I can never do the quotations. I kept me to where oh, where's my little, little doggy dog gone. Guy. I thought you were going to say that. It's, and the next line is, oh, oh, where, where can, can you be? be? This will do just as well for this, with his no. ears cut short and his tail <laughs> cut long. Where is that Scots laddie wee? It's... He went to fight the French. That's it. It's the Blue Bells of Scotland. Oh, yeah. Uh, author Dorothea Jordan, and as she didn't live until 1762 and died in the 19th century, I think she's talking about fighting the French sort of later on. Um, oh, where and oh, where is your Highland laddie gone? He's gone to fight the French for King George upon the throne. And it's oh in my heart how I wish him safe at home. Frank Muir. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married. Too long have we tarried, but what shall we do for a ring? And they sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bung trees grow. Yes. And there in a wood, a piggy wig stood. <laughs> with a ring on the end of his nose, his nose. With a ring on the end of his nose. Well done. <laughs> Title and author? Lear. Yes? The owl and the, um... <laughs> and <laughs> pussycat. Well done. Four marks. Now, Dillis Powell... Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Well, it's Shakespeare, yeah. William. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Havoc Cry. It's a Havoc Cry, yes. Yeah. It's, um, it's Julius Caesar. Yes, quite right. It's Mark Antony's speech over the body of Julius Caesar. Yes. Um, oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen, then I and you and all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Two marks. Dennis Norton. 
Ah, make the most of what we yet may spend before we too into the dust descend. Dowson, is it something like a, an unfamiliar Ernest Dowson poem? Lots of cups and wines and things. Could you say Or is it Kayam? Is it Omar Kayam? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's Omar Kayam, yeah. <laughs> Bye. Fitzgerald. Yes. But I don't know how it ends. Uh, two, two out of four, then. Edward Fitzgerald's translation, Omar Kayam, uh, first version. I'll make the most of what we yet may spend before we too into the dust descend. Dust into dust and under dust to lie, sans wine, sans song, sans singer, and sans end. Mm. Well, then we have a round of origins and derivations. Three marks, possible, if members of the team can first of all get the present meaning of these phrases or words right, and then give the origin and derivation. Beginning with Anne Scott James again. Anne, what does utopia mean, and how did it originate? It means a heavenly or ideal place. Yes. And it originates from the... It's the title of uh, Moore's book. Yeah. Uh, when he wrote about the same said ideal place. Yes. Which Moore? Uh, Thomas. Yes, that's all right. Three marks it is. Frank Muir. To leave no stone unturned. Well, it means to explore every avenue. <laughs> it's a great little politician's phrase, this, isn't it? <clears throat> well, fair enough. It means that you'll use every endeavour to, uh, un to arrive at the um, truth or the information that you want. And it's alleged to come from a particular incident a long time ago. I wonder if you know what it is. Burke and Hare. <laughs> <laughs> the resurrectionists Burke smothered them hair dug them up <laughs> and they left no gravestone unturned <laughs> or was it um, how long ago was it? oh three thousand no, no two and a half thousand years ago I it with Pericles uh, it's earlier than Pericles earlier than Pericles mythological character no no, no not a mythological no, historical oh, no, um, one and a half, I think, out of three. Um, and, as Frank Moore says, it means to be extremely thorough in what you're trying to do. But um, there was a great battle between the Greeks and the Persians at Plataea, and the um, Persian Mardonius, who was defeated, was supposed to have left an awful lot of treasure in or around his tent. And the victor, the Greek Polycrates, wanted naturally to find this treasure, couldn't find it, consulted the oracle at Delphi, and the oracle said, leave no stone unturned. So he sent all his men digging all over the battlefield and found the treasure, and it's a happy story, and that's the ending. One and a half. <laughs> Dear Spar, to cast pearls before swine. Well, it means to lavish something good on, something that's on people who don't deserve it. Yes. And origin? The Bible. I think it is. The it? Bible. Yes. Giving something good to somebody who's incapable of appreciating it. Um, it's in St. Matthew's Gospel. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest haply they trample them under their feet and turn and rend you. Now, Dennis Norton, your word is bakshi. B-U-C-K-S-H-E-E. -E. It's usually spelled that way. Bakshi. Well, it, it means free. Yes. For nothing. Um, bakshi. Sounds like an effeminate male rabbit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I should think <laughs> it's it's a bit of a Clarence. It, yeah. <laughs> it's Indian or something. It yes, sounds it like a troops word. Yes, it is. It, it's Indian or Arabian or something. Something that the troops brought back. Yes, it, it comes from an Indian word and one again which is fairly familiar. Bakshish. Yes. Bakshish. Yes, that's it. Bakshish. Three yeah. marks you get. And now we come to the last round and go back to the quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the programme. For two marks, Anne Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Let them eat cake. Well, it's always attributed to Marie Antoinette. And why did she do it? Well, because she was told that the poor of Paris had no bread, so she mm -hmm. said, rather foolishly, well, let them eat cake. Yes, absolutely right. Uh, it may have been used earlier in history, but it's normally attributed to uh, Marie Antoinette, the wife of Louis XVI, some little time before they both lost their heads. Um, two marks. Now, Dillis Powell, the origin of your quotation, which was, 
You left behind a broken doll. Well, it was a song very popular a long time ago. I should say in about the time of the first war. Um, chance. I think one and a half. It's a Victorian song by Clifford Harris, and the title is You Called Me Baby Doll a Year Ago. Well, now I shall ask uh, Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation gets the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back, first of all, to Dennis Norden with his quotation, Let Them Eat Cake. Well, she didn't say this. Marie Antoinette. She wasn't, just wasn't that kind of a girl. I actually had a cousin who looked terribly like Marie Antoinette. So much like it, she had to leave his job in the end. Um, <laughs> he, um, I, I never did believe she said anything as nasty as this. And I got confirmation of it when I bought in the Portobello Road a writing desk of the time of Louis the Sixteenth for 35 bob. <laughs> Which isn't bad for Louis sixteen, is it? It works out just over two bob a Louis, actually. <laughs> if you work it out. And in this writing desk was a drawer. And in the drawer was a diary in Marie Antoinette's own hand. I don't know how she got the hand into <laughs> the drawer, but I've had that trouble sometimes. And in this diary, it gave the actual facts of what happened on that momentous evening when she's said to have said this. That evening, they were having people to dinner, her and Louis, you know. And she had ordered an ox to be roasted whole for dinner, because it gives a meal man appeal, you know. And <laughs> She was in the kitchen while it was cooking and you know, she was just sort of doing the last minute things to it, taking the harness off and... <laughs> sort of... <laughs> chopping away the cart, you know, and things like that. And she was just reaching for a 16-gallon drum, because there's an awful lot of gravy, you see, with, a, <laughs> with an ox, when who should rush in but Louis himself? And he said... Après moi, le déluge, <laughs> which is French expression meaning the shower is after me. You see? <laughs> and she said, what, what do you mean? And he said, the poor people of Paris. At that moment, a stone crashed through the window, and outside there was this mob muttering, you know, Danton, Marat. <laughs> they were out there shaking their fists and muttering, French epithets, like, give us some epithet bread. And <laughs> Come out, you fat epithet, you see. <laughs> and she said, what is the matter with them? And he said, they have no bread. So she said, you mean they're starving? And he said, yes. At which, instead of uttering this awful, sick joke, which history is reputed to her, she cut down the ox and gave them her own supper. She pushed forward the royal wheelbarrow and said to the bewildered Louis, not let them eat cake, but, and this was, of course, he couldn't hear properly because of this crowd muttering, you know, liberté, galité, and epithet fraternité, you know. <laughs> what she actually said to him was, load the meat, cock. <laughs> well, now all the European history books will have to be rewritten. And before they do that, we'll go back to Frank Muir and his quotation, you left behind a broken doll. I was the victim of a schizophrenic tattooist. And that's why I lost the overdraft at the bank. 
and why whenever I have to fill up one of those questionnaires you get from the council or for a passport or something, I have to write there, you left behind a broken doll. It really is infuriating. What happened was, it was some time ago, and I wanted to uh, speak to my bank manager about getting some money out of him of what is humorously called a personal loan. <laughs> Now, to do this, I obviously had to impress him that I was a solid citizen. So I put on my sincerest dark blue suit, a sober tie, a pair of mid-blue socks. Those are important. Note that. Mid-blue socks and a pair of black shoes lightly buffed. <laughs> and I made my way to the bank just before lunch. Plenty of time, you see. And happily, on the way there, on the bus, I was bitten by a bird, by a, a rather annoyed canary. The lady next to me had this canary in a, in, in a cage, and um, it obviously objected to my lightly buffed black shoes being near it. It was right on the floor next to them, and this canary bit me in the ankle. I yelped a little, as one does when one is bitten in the ankle by a canary, but, <laughs> but the canary had made a small hole in my left sock. And as I got off the bus and walked to, towards the bank, I felt my left heel uh, being a little draughty. And I looked down, and of course, my mid-blue coloured socks, which were wool, had now got a sizeable hole in them, the left one, about the size of half a crown. <laughs> now, you cannot pretend to your bank manager that you are a sober, respectable citizen, standing there in your sincere suit, and a dirty great hole in your left sock. What to do? I thought a good deal about this problem, quite naturally. Then I realised that the only sensible solution would be to have that particular part of my heel tattooed blue. <laughs> so I went into a phone box and got a classified telephone directory and found there was a tattooist called Fred Merrylove who lived in the East India Dock Road. I found this tattooist and entered. A very nice man, elderly, rather a sort of staring look in his eye. He said, oh, sir, I'm so glad to see you. Customs kind of dropped off with the tattooing trade. I don't think I've had tattoo tattoos since 1922. <laughs> so he said, now, what can I do for you, sir? Oh, sir, kind sir, I can do you the Beatles, of whom you have no doubt heard, sir. I can do you Paul McCarthy or Bingo. I can do a speaking likeness of... E I said, no, thank you. He said, I can do you comedians. I can do you Ken Dodd. I said, no, thank you. I want you to t tattoo a small blue circle on my left ankle. It seemed to sort of chill him. <laughs> he went sort of white. And then he said, you're the first customer I've had, sir, for the last 18 years. I'd hoped that I could do something on you worthy of my needle craft. But this, a strange gleam came in his eye. He said, proffer me your ankle, sir. And dipping a needle thing with a little wooden handle into some rather glongy blue stuff, he jabbed it with full force into my left ankle. I fainted away. I fainted clean away. When I came to, he said, I'm so sorry, sir, you're a little disturbed, but I'm sure you'll, you'll find my work very satisfactory. <laughs> It was a rather worried Muir who made his way to the bank. But anyway, the hole didn't show in my sock. The blue looked exactly like the wall. And I sat down on the manager's chair. As I sat down on the manager's chair, I suddenly felt a little restless on the left side of where one normally sits down. <laughs> a kind of prickly, burning sensation. It's rather squirming around, so I had to do a sort of tilt to the right during the interview. And this burning sensation on the left side of where a chap sits down got worse and worse until I was squirming all over the place. So, of course, the manager said, I'm sorry, you're obviously a, a restless sort of person, not the sort of person in whom the bank wishes to uh, uh, repose its money. We prefer more solid, uh, permanent citizens, um, so I'm afraid we must refuse your loan. So I lost my loan. When I got back home, this burning was really quite painful. So I went into the bathroom, stripped off, stuck a large mirror to the ceiling with shaving, <laughs> with shaving foam, lay face downwards, 
and with the aid of my wife's hand mirror, had a sort of periscope effect. <laughs> and there I saw that on my left... No, I, um... <laughs> on the left side of where a chap normally sits down, <laughs> this tattooist had tattooed one of his pictures. And that's why I said right at the beginning this awful indignity that whenever I have these government forms to fill in for permission to use a handheld water hose in the garden, you know, <laughs> you get these questions like subsection S, do you speak Hindustani? Uh, subsection T, have you any distinguishing marks? Yes or no? Subsection U, if you have any distinguishing marks, where are they? What colour? And describe them. For the rest of my life, my form will read, You left behind a blue Ken Dodd. <laughs> well, by your vote, Frank Muir just wins the contest of the two stories and that leads to a final score in which Dillis Powell and Frank Muir win by one mark only from Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton and this also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word you heard Dillis Powell Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the program and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Dennis Norden, and Frank Muir. Round one tries to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words roughly right. Beginning with Dillis Powell, I want the meaning of the word febrile. F-E-B-R-I-L-E. -E. Febrile. Feverish. Feverish, it is. Comes from the Latin word meaning fever. I always used to call it febrile. But well, so did I. No, you rather well shook me and you said... I looked it up with very great care. Really? And apparently the received pronunciation is febrile. Dennis Norton. Uh, what is a cinerary urn? A cinerary urn. It's rather horrible, actually. It's, it's what they bung you in after you've been cremated, I believe. It's all the ultimate in ashtrays. Or we went, why I say the last word in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there it is. It's what you keep grandfather in. Uh, two marks. All right, Anne Scott James. What is a wane? W-A-I-N, a wain. Oh, it's a delicious old peasant word for a wagon. Absolutely right. Two marks. Thank you. What is penology? <laughs> is it a penal, penal yeah. code thing? Penology. Is it juggery? The study of um, prisons? Yes, hold yes. And uh, the study of cellular construction? <laughs> that I wouldn't. Yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yes, you're quite right. It's the study of punishment or of prison management from the Greek word meaning punishment. Latin too. Mm -hmm. 
Well, before we start round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and the two women members of the team go on studying their quotations, because at the end, I shall ask them where those quotations come from. Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, here's your quotation. For whom the bell tolls, and Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, yours is, you made me love you, I didn't want to do it. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Round two is about classical mythology. Two marks for right answers. Dennis Powell, what were the Lares and Penates, or if you prefer it, Lares and Penates? They were kind of domestic deities. Yes. Where did they you were domestic deities. That's right. Where did you put them? Um, at home. <laughs> Fair enough. You put some of them in the half. Yes, that's right. That's what I wanted. Put them in the half. And what, did, uh, what were they for? Well, they were looking after the house. Yes, absolutely right. You, you get your two marks. These were Roman gods. Uh, the Lares um, were identified with the spirits of the dead. And the other ones, the Penates, um, they were the gods of the storeroom. And you put them all in a row uh, by the hearth, and they looked after the house and the family. Too much. Uh, Dennis Norton, who was Nike? N I K E. Well, it was a Greek goddess. Of what? She was the goddess of. Victory. <laughs> she was the goddess of victory. Yes? Oh, yep. well done. Absolutely yeah. right. And they dug her up in Samothrace. Oh, that's the winged victory. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah, yes. Winged. That's right. So the most famous statue, I suppose, is the one in the Louvre in Paris, which is the winged victory of Samothrace. But she was the Greek goddess of victory, and she was kept, poor girl, by Zeus permanently on Olympus because he didn't want victory to escape from him, wanted always to be in charge. Too much. And Scott James, who was Metis? M-E-T-I-S. Metis. Give that one to Dilly, she knows. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, it's rather more difficult, one. Yes, I can't remember at all. They used to park their chariots up against it. <laughs> <laughs> God of traffic wardens. Oh, that's right, yes, the God of traffic wardens. <laughs> yes, she might, she might well be. Um, <laughs> she was the goddess of the race course, let's try that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't think you're going to get it. No, Sorry. nor do I. Um, she was the goddess of wise counsel. Um, she was the first wife of Zeus, and he was terrified that she might give birth to a son who would be wiser and stronger than he was, so he ate her. Um, not a sort of very nice habit, yeah. but even that didn't do him much good because then the goddess Athene sprang fully armed from his head and she became a kind of goddess of wisdom after that. No marks, I'm afraid. Erotic life, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, People springing from... Yes, yes. Frank Muir, next. Who was Morpheus? <clears throat> Got asleep. Not quite. As in, in Morpheus' tender arms, I... What? Not quite sleep. <laughs> Not sleep. Warm beds. Ah. <laughs> yeah, something. Uh, no. Electric blanket. Huh? <laughs> dreams. Yes. Yes. He, Morpheus was the god of uh, dreams. He, in most uh, legends, he is the son of the god of sleep, who is Hypnos or Hypnos. He brought dreams. Uh, he, his name meant the shaper or fashioner of dreams, and they came in two kinds. Those that came out of the good and bad. Well, that's exactly what. <laughs> not quite. No, true and untrue. The out of the ivory gate came the dreams which deceive you, and out of the gate of horn came the true ones. Two marks. Well, the next round is about rhyming slang. Two marks, if you can tell me uh, the meaning of the following expressions. Dillis Power, tit for tat. The meaning hat. of... Yeah. Hat, yes, yeah, sorry. Hat. Yes, tit for tat well, tit stands for. for hat, and yes, usually abbreviated to tit for. Uh, two marks. Dennis Norton, sausage and mash. Cash. <laughs> yeah, usually abbreviated nowadays to sausage. I haven't got a sausage. Uh, beans and hash is the other example. I haven't got a bean. Two marks. And Scott James, Bo Peep. Sleep. Yes. <laughs> and Frank Muir, Sheep, Butcher. I would have thought. <laughs> 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 and Frank Muir, Butcher's Hook. Luke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Butcher's Hook means look, often abbreviated to let's have a butcher's. Two marks. Everybody's got everything right in that round. Well done. Well, the next round is about the origins of um, popular phrases, where they come from, derivations. 
Uh, three marks if I get the present meaning um, correctly put to me by members of the team, and then the origin of the phrase where it originally came from. Uh, Ulysses Power, he has snuffed it. Means he's dead. Yes, and alludes, what's the allusion Snuffing to? Snuffing a candle, I should have thought. Yes, which means what? You put it out by putting the snuffer on top. Yes, that'll do. He has snuffed it means you're dead, or you could be, you, you, you've kind of crashed financially. Um, but it's snuffing a candle, extinguishing it with a snuffer, and the illusion is to the candle flame of life. Three marks. Dennis Norton, to take time by the forelock. Well, it means do it now. Yeah. Um, the origin, I should think, was sort of self-evident. You... If you, if you just want to stop somebody who's passing, you've got to seize them by something. <laughs> the forelock is as good a place as any and better than some. <laughs> <laughs> and old Father Time had a sort yes. of beetle haircut which yes. you gripped him yes. by. That's it, yes. Mm. And what happened if you missed him? I mean, why didn't you grip him by his back hair? Oh, he hasn't got any. That's it, exactly right. That's what I want. Uh, to take time by the forelock, seize the present moment, because your opportunity may pass by if you don't. And time is normally represented as having this great lock of hair on his forehead, but he's completely bald at the back of his head, so that you wanted to sort of catch him <coughs> coming rather than going. Um, three marks. And Scott James, to have an eye to the main chance. Oh, it means to be an opportunist. Mm-hmm. Yep. <clears throat> and comes from gambling. Oh, course. a gambling game. We got to specify the gambling game. Yes, that's the trouble. Dicing. It dicing. is dice, yes. From you're dicing. Get, you're getting there. Two and a half, I think. Um, to have an eye to the main chance means nowadays to keep uh, in your view constantly the advantage or the money to be made out of something. And it comes from the game called Hazard, which is played with dice. The first throw, which was called the main, had to be of a particular order between four and nine. And if you got it right, then you threw the second time, which was your chance, which determined the score you got. So, main chance were the two things in the game. Hank Muir, the smell of the lamp. The smell of the lamp means, uh, nowadays, to give, uh, to show evidence of over-zealous lucubrations. Yeah, in doing what? Um, in writing. Yes, yeah. It means that you've worked so hard overnight that the paper is beginning to smell of the paraffin oil. That's it. That'll do. Three marks. Um, something which is laboured, or the work has been studied, overstudied, and worked on too much, and, and the, the evidence of the composition shows through it. And uh, the midnight oil uh, is the obvious example. It is the lamp uh, which had gone on burning too long, and it uh, meant that uh, there was too much stressing of trifles, too much pedantry, and the resulting work uh, showed it. And the next round is about famous last words, or nearly last words, of the famous. Two marks, if you can tell me who said these uh, words. Beginning with Dillis Powell. Poor, unhappy me, a victim to nervousness and fancied terrors, and all because of my money. 19th century one. 19th, 19th century. He, he died in the 19th century. Died in the 19th century. Early. Um, early <laughs> he died. He died in the early 19th century. Um, he was a man. Uh, he was a. All that. He, he was a real person. He wasn't historical. He wasn't a, fi a fictional character. He was a historical character. Can you eat him? <laughs> um, he was a politician. No. He wasn't a politician. He was a writer. No, he was much richer than all that. Richer than all that. He was mm. just a rich man. He was a, he was a, he was a lord. He was an aristocrat. No, you're not going to get it. Ah. No, Mark. He's in commerce. <laughs> no, no. Nathan Rothschild, ah. who died in 1836. Ah. Oh, what a... Rich. <coughs> Dennis Norton. I killed one man to save a hundred thousand. A villain to save innocence. A savage wild beast to give repose to my country. This was the last word. Mm -hmm. It's a woman and not a man. I'll help you that much. Some celebrated avengers. And, um, yes, yeah. and some noble murderess. Now, what noble murderesses do we know? 
Oh, it's the French Revolution. The French Revolution, yes. yes. No. What's that lady? Corday is what yes, I Yes, Charlotte think of. Corday. Who killed? Do you remember? Manard, yes, fast. absolutely. Right. Yes, I think you you fought your way through to your two marks. It's Charlotte Corday who Chisel. killed the revolutionary Marat in his bath, which I always think is an odd thing to do. What was she doing there? <laughs> <laughs> Scrubbing his back. <laughs> and Scott James, oh Rouen, I fancy you will one day rue my death. Well, it must have been Joan of Arc. It is Joan of Arc. <laughs> Said when she was being burnt at the stake, two marks. Frank Miller, from a private station, you have raised me to that of a countess. From a countess, you have made me a queen. And now you can raise me one step higher to be a saint in heaven. Well, we've got something to work on, haven't we? <clears throat> <laughs> she wasn't a saint on earth. She's a married lady. Yes. Presumably. She was a queen. Yes. And she wasn't a countess at the start of it all. Yeah, that's right. One of Henry VIII's people. Mm -hmm. that's yes. Right. Uh -huh. One of Henry VIII's. Well, we'll have six goes. No, it's Anne, must be yeah. Anne uh, Bullen. No. Right. Quite right, it's Anne Bullen, Bullen, to Henry VIII's before her execution. Two marks in the Tower of London. Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. For two marks, Dillis Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation, For Whom the Bell Tolls? Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And John, Dan or Don. That's right. John Don, in his devotions, it's the bit, the quotation that starts, No man is an island entirely of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And then it ends, For Whom the Bell Tolls, it tolls for thee. Oh. I always wonder if no man is an island, what about the Isle of Man? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can't have heard of that. I didn't, yes, it's, uh, and Scott James, the origin of your quotation, which was, you made me love you, I didn't want to do it. Well, I'm sure it's a song. Yep. A song? What sort of date? Oh, I should think sort of 1916-ish. Yes, that's a good shot. Uh, you don't remember the author's expert. I fear not. Um, it was a very popular song in the First World War. It was written in 1912 by Joe McCarthy and James Monaco or Monaco. Now, back to Frank and Dennis, because I want me, them to tell me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So first, Frank Muir, for whom the bell tolls. Uh, the other day, I was uh, uh, pawing over some ancient volumes I have. I was pouring some paraffin oil over them. <laughs> I didn't, didn't want them anymore. They weren't very valuable. I'd, um, I'd bought them from two other pretty girls. Uh, they had run this place in Chelsea, and you buy them by the yard. I haven't got a shop yet. They've got this little <laughs> stall. You go through the yard, and there's this stall. <laughs> and I bought three feet of these books for 30 shillings. And I was just applying a match when I suddenly realised that one of them I hadn't read. And I opened this volume, and it was covered with very scrawly, very ancient writing. And I realised it was old English before the Canterbury Tales had flared across the sky like a flying Chaucer. Here was, a, here was an account written in manuscript. So I prepared to translate it. I got my Old English, Middle English dictionary. I got a large magnifying glass, and I started deciphering this manuscript. And it was the true account of England in that twilight when the Romans had left this country, when they were called back in their legions back to Rome, and Rome fell, and when the Britons were about to be attacked by everybody. And if you remember, all the ancient Britons were really clustered round the West Country, Cornwall and Devon and so on, and they were their subject to all sorts of attack. It really was a fascinating story of what went on in those days. From the south there were these barbarians from the Mediterranean coast with all hairy, with furry knees. They were called the, <laughs> the furry nations, and they would try to, <laughs> they tried to, to steal all the Cornish tin. And then there, there were the Danes invading the whole of the East Coast, Essex, 
and they captured so many tiny villages that even today these tiny villages are called after the names of, of the Danish prince, Hamlet. And <laughs> the Norse, the Norse were invading from Norse America. And all the time they were being pressed. And the Saxons, the Saxons from uh, wherever the Saxons invaded from, quite near Sax Coburg, I think. <laughs> and all the time these poor little Britons, who were rather small men, not very big, about four foot seven, <laughs> they didn't know what to do. They were being slaughtered. They couldn't run away because they were dressed in skins. And they had a belt round to keep the skins tight. But the belt was a leather belt, and it was tied into a knot. See, and when they ran, their leather belt came undone, and they couldn't run any faster, and they were in danger of extermination. Now, according to this manuscript, in this corner of the West Country, there, were, there was a man. They were all named after their, their town in those days, and he was Beowulf Budley Salterton. <laughs> and he was very concerned with this problem of, of extermination. And he had a very clever friend who was called Egbert Frome from Somerset. So Beowulf Budley Salterton said, how are we going to stop these invaders? The Saxons were coming along the south of the country and threatening the west. How are we going to stop the Saxons? So Beowulf thought very carefully about it and said, we must have audible warning of approach. So he devised two empty woad tins and a length of string, you see. And he found that you could hear a Saxon when he spoke with this device, which he called a saxophone. <laughs> he, was a, he was a terribly good inventor, but he was awfully bad at putting names to his invention. But he, Egbert, um, Beowulf, put, Budley Salterton, said, but it's no good seeing them in time because we can't run away because our skins fall down, because our belts untie. And Egbert Foam thought about this, and he thought, if only I could find some way of keeping our skins on, we could then run away to Wales and form the Welsh nation. And Egbert Firm thought about this, and he thought, the trouble is the knot unties in the leather. Now, say I punched holes in the leather and put a sort of metal pin on the other side of the leather, which would go through the hole, the belt would stay on. The witch... He did! <laughs> Whereupon, all the ancient Britons, as soon as they heard the Saxons through the saxophone, they ran, they ran like mad, all around the end of the River Severn, and, in, and they founded the Welsh nation, and they lived there, and all the invading hordes couldn't get to them, and they're still there now. But you know, Egbert Foam was, was really honoured for his invention. He grew old and honoured in Wales. He used to go from village to village, and used to punch holes in the belts of all the inhabitants. And uh, he was the first sort of wholesale man. And um, <laughs> he used to sell their holes. And, and, when he, and every time he came to a village in, to do him honor, they used to ring ding dong, ding dong from the chapel bell. <laughs> and sometimes people would come up to this very old man and say, why are you so honored? Why do they ring ding dong, ding dong from the bell when you come near? Who are you? And he used to say proudly, me, I am from the belt holes. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this is before they had iron, you see. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> when I think back to our wedding day, and my mother drawing me on one side and saying, Horsa, my daughter, remember, if anything goes wrong, your dad and I will always keep a place for you in the cave. <laughs> and I laughed, because I thought, what could go wrong? Here I'm marrying Hengist, the handsomest swine... <laughs> There's a bit of a gap. And it's the handsomest swine herd in the whole of Anglia. Do you remember those days and how we set off in the chariot with just married on the back? <laughs> and we made our way to the southwest of England. And there we constructed that little hut, the clay for the floor, the wattle for the walls, the rushes for the bed. And together, <laughs> together we lived there with the swine, just the 16 of us. <laughs> And that first New Year's Eve together, when you raised your glass of mead and you said, my dear, in 15 seconds, it will be 32 BC. <laughs> Let us drink. And at that moment, there was a sound of voices and hammering outside. And you looked through the clay windows and said, what's that? It sounds like it comes from Stonehenge Way. And you peered through the darkness and it, you said, it is. And I said, what's happening? He said, it looked like they're putting up a new block. <laughs> he said, I'll slip out. And you went. You slipped out, taking one of the pigs on your head to protect you from the rain. <laughs> Wester, do you remember the sow? <laughs> and you were away for three weeks. And when you got back, you had changed in some strange way. And you said, they're all in long white robes and they've got beards and they've asked me to join their organization. And I said, who are they? And you said, they're some new sort of sect. We'd never talked about sects before. <laughs> and I said, what did they do? He, you said, well, they sacrifice virgins on Midsummer Eve. And I said, what for? And you said, that's the bit I didn't understand. <laughs> it's either to, to bring rain or it's part of the export drive. <clears throat> they want me to be one of them. I said, but you're a swine herd. And you said, I don't want to be a swine herd all my life. Don't you see this is a chance for me to have a white toga job. <laughs> They've offered me the post of assistant slab polisher and you took it and you worked your way up from assistant slab polisher to deputy knife holder and finally chief virgin finder <laughs> I think that's where our marriage started going wrong it wasn't the hours it was you brought your work home with you every night that's why I'm leaving Hengist, I wanted a swine herd. That's what I wanted for a husband. That's what I haven't got. You made me leave you. I didn't want a druid. <laughs> The chisel must have got a bit blunt before the end of that letter. <laughs> well, by your vote, Frank Muir just wins the contest of the two stories, and that brings us to a final score in which, nevertheless, Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton win the whole contest by one mark, and this also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. Thank you.
BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton. Round one tries to test their vocabularies. Uh, two marks if they get the meanings of these words reasonably right. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Anne, I want to know the meaning of crinkum, crankum. Crinkle. Okay. Yes, that sort of thing. Crank, crank, crank and cranky. What you get in your Wiggly back. woggly. Wiggly woggly will do. <laughs> two marks. Full of, full of twists and turns, tortuous, and it can be either literally like some roads or it can be figuratively about a character or anything of that sort. Well done, Anne. Two marks. <clears throat> uh, Frank, what is a barton? B-A-R-T-O-N. A barton? Hmm. Uh, it's a round thing with four holes in it which keep your trousers up. <laughs> 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 Better try again, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Barton, 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 Barton. No idea. It is, in fact, a farmyard or a farm not let with the rest of the manor but retained by the owner rather than given out to a tenant. It means a barley enclosure originally. Um, there's Paul. The meaning of the word gravid, G R A V I D. Gravid. Heavy? Mm, yes, in a particular sense. Heavy plus one. Yes, heavy plus one, but explain. Great. Pregnant. Pregnant, that's better. <laughs> 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 Two marks it is. Pregnant, it, in the medical sense, it can be also in a sort of literary sense, pregnant with meaning. Now, Dennis Norton. Dennis, what is a dendrologist? D-E-N-D-R-O-L-O-G-I-S-T, dendrologist. Well, ology is the study of. Yes. Dendro is Trees. what's left of a rhododendron. If you take, <laughs> if you take rhoda out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, you're there. <laughs> well, it's not much of a rhododendron. It's a sort of harp, is it? <laughs> Tree. I see. I've just been handed a written note. <laughs> I will read it to you. Trees. <laughs> Uh, was that a request for a song, or is it...? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that'll do. It means a student of, or a writer about, trees. <laughs> Quite a subject, I suppose, really. That's the end of that round. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and then I want the two women members of the team to go on studying those quotations, because at the end, I shall ask them the source of the quotations. And Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton Here's your quotation. Do not go gentle into that good night. And now, Dillis Powell and Frank, yours is the fleas that tease in the high Pyrenees. And, the, and then at the end of the track, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these words came to be said or written. Well, the next round's all about verse and poetry. I give each member of each team a quotation and ask them to complete it for the next line or two. Two marks if they can complete the quotation, and two more if they can correctly name the source. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Wealth I seek not, hope nor love, nor a friend to know me. Oh, that's one of those wandering poets, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. Um, Stevenson, is it? Yes, well done. That's a fellow below me. That's right. Oh, yes, the star sums above and the... What would he have below him? Earth below me. Or a I think foam rubber cushion or something. The stars <laughs> above and the... He was always walking. <laughs> and the road below me. Golly, good. Yeah. I'll give you all four Feet. marks. It helped, it helped you a bit, but still. <laughs> what I seek, not hope, nor love, nor a friend to know me. All I seek, the heaven above and the road below me. It's The Vagabond by Robert Louis Stevenson from his Songs of Travel. Frank me not. Her aunt, who from her earliest youth had kept a strict regard for truth. Oh, well, this... Oh. At a guess, it smells like uh, cautionary tales. Yes, quite right. By Hilaire Belloc. Yes, good. <laughs> Can you complete girl? it? Yes, absolutely right. And do you remember the girl's name? It's uh, Matilda. Yes, Matilda. 
is it? Um, yes. yes, absolutely right. My children it is. I don't think you're going to be able to complete it. I'll give you three no. out of four. Um, it's Hilaire Belloc's cautionary tales, a tale about this terrible child called Matilda, um, who told such dreadful lies it made one gasp and stretch one's eyes. Um, her aunt, who from her earliest youth had kept a strict regard for truth, attempted to believe Matilda. The effort very nearly killed her. <laughs> <laughs> now, dearest pal, if you were the only girl in the world and I were the only boy... Well, we would find such... something rather well, next to Nothing else would... Yes? Come on, Fred. Papa in the world today. <laughs> we would go on loving in, in the, the same, same old way. way. Sounds like the cup A line. garden <laughs> of weed and jars made for two with no one to share. That's right. Um, 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 <laughs> nothing. If you again. were the only girl in the world And I charming, was right? the only <laughs> boy <laughs> Sung by Violet Lorraine and George Roby during the First World War in a show called The Bing Boys. That's yeah. right. I think you can get your four marks uh, song <laughs> And being able to complete the rap I'm not going to... Um, read it again because you've got it quite right but it's if you were the only girl in the world from the bing boys written by george grossmith the younger oh. and fred thompson four marks dennis norton he crams with cans of poisoned meat the subjects of the king that's chesterton quite right the grocer yeah and it's something about when they with cans of poison meat, the subject of the king. Isn't it? When there's something can drop down dead, he laughs like anything. Yes, it's absolutely right. <laughs> Very near right. Uh, I'll give you all four marks. He crams the cans of poison meat, the subjects of the king, and when they die by thousands, why, he laughs like anything. Um, it's t a terrible song against grocers, which begins, God made the wicked grocer for a mystery and a sign that men might shun the awful shop and go to inns and dine. And uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton wrote it. Four marks. Next round's about the origins and derivations of fairly familiar phrases. Uh, three marks, possible total. I want, first of all, the present meaning, and then the origin of these uh, words or expressions. Beginning with Anne Scott James. A land of milk and honey. Well, it means a land where there's plenty of food. Yeah. And comfort and money and yeah. affluent society, it means, really. Affluent society, good enough. And when I imagine it comes from the Bible, doesn't yes. it? Isn't it where Moses it. arrived? Yes. Uh, Exodus. Yes. A land or a place abounding in good things, and it's Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, in case you want it. Um, God appears to Moses and tells him he's come down to deliver the children of Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them to a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Crank me up. A Roland for an Oliver. It means a... A half dozen of one for six of the other. Yes. A Tweedledum for a Tweedledee. Yes. <laughs> they were romantic characters, weren't they? From the old Char romances. Charlemagne. Yes. It's the story of Charlemagne and Roland, you know. And Oliver. Roncival, yes. Mm. yes. Mm -hmm. um, Roland from Oliver means tit for tat, and they were two uh, very famous knights. They were paladins of Charlemagne, and they were so equally matched that... As Frank has said, anything one could do, the other could do just as well or even better. Three marks. Dennis Power, thumbs up. Thumbs up means it's absolutely okay. Yeah. And it comes from the gladiatorial games. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's wrong, because at least somebody once wrote to correct me anyhow. Uh, I always understood that when the gladiator was was more or less done for mm -hmm. that the emperor turned his thumbs down if he was to be killed yeah. well somebody wrote to me angrily and said nonsense it was the other way around but i really don't know I, well, that, anyhow that's what it's all about as far as i know the scholars may disagree on this but as far as i know the first is the right interpretation well it means uh, today thumbs up means all is well somebody has succeeded in something or other and the romans did i think um, signify approval or disapproval by putting thumbs up or down, respectively. And particularly, as Dillis has said, when at the end of the fight, one gladiator had another one at his mercy, 
the chap who was winning looked up at the box where the master of the ceremonies, who might be the emperor, was sitting and said, well, should I finish this chap off or not? Thumbs up meant no, let the chap go. Thumbs down meant oop, bang, and he went. All the other way around. <laughs> 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 Just to stop any letters. Exactly. Yeah. Mixing Greek and Latin. <laughs> Three marks. Dennis Norden, to the nth degree. Well, it means, um, it means, I'm not sure whether it means to an infinite amount or to a very large amount. I stick to the first one. I believe, no, I say that because I believe actually mathematically to the nth degree doesn't mean to infinity. It no, means it doesn't. to any, no. No, something to the power of n means to any required number you may choose. I, you know, they always say let n be That's it. the number. So yep. it didn't mean infinity, it meant whatever you wanted it. That's right. I mean. uh, it, they are absolutely dead right. The <laughs> mathematical conception, which is the origin, um, n equals any number plus n-dimensional means having an indefinite number of dimensions and from that it comes to mean to an unlimited extent but originally Dennis is absolutely right this is the way in which the mathematicians used it three marks next round is about place names and there are some place names that uh, bring before us the idea of certain commodities which are associated with those places so much so that the place name is sometimes used on its own without giving the name of the commodity but everybody knows what's meant now for two marks with what do you associate the following places? Anne Scott James, Limoges. Oh, enamel. And enamel in a particular sense. Painted enamel. Yes, uh, but what would you put it on today? I mean, on, on what's, what's the ground, the base? On porcelain. Yes, thank you. You see, enamel can mean on metal. Oh, <coughs> yes, well. Mm. Um, Limoges now porcelain. is delicate porcelain, as Limoges is a city in west central France. Um, Principally now porcelain, but they did also do decorative enamel work on metal exactly. in earlier times. Two marks. Frank Muir, Edam or Adam, E D A M. It's a, it's a Dutch cheese, rather like a, a bloodshot melon. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in, descriptively, Frank is right. A round Dutch cheese, uh, usually yellow inside, and with the rind dyed red. I mean, it isn't the natural colour, but they dyed that colour. And it comes from a place in Holland. And uh, Dennis Powell, Bakewell. <laughs> Tarts. Mm -hmm. well, also the home of Jack Longland. <laughs> <laughs> and family. Yes, I'd, I'd like uh, <coughs> any advance on tart. <laughs> well, it's a kind of round cake with a pastry outside and a kind of almond and egg and something rather in the yep. middle. It's but very you'd be, good. You'd be drummed out of Bakewell if you called it a tart. Should I? Yeah. What should I call it's it? A pudding. Uh, a Bakewell pudding, in order not to get into frightful trouble at home, or Bakewell tart, as they said. <laughs> Dennis Norton, Delft, D-E-L-F-T. Well, it's a kind of pottery. Yes, colours? Blue and white. That's yeah, it, right, yes. Blue and white. Uh, a Delft, in Holland, they make this particular kind of pottery, normally has a white background glaze, and the designs or decorations are in blue on this white ground, and it's well known throughout the world. Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier on the programme. So, Anne Scott James, for two marks, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Do not go gentle into that good night. Dylan Thomas. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good enough. It's the title and first line of a Dylan Thomas poem, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. He wrote it when his father was old and ill. Two marks. Now, it is, Powell, the origin of your quotation, which was, the fleas, the teas in the high Pyrenees. Pillar Belloc. Yes. Remember the name of the poem? Tarantella. <laughs> good. Yes. Do you right. remember an in Miranda? Do you remember an in... That's it. Two marks. And now I'm going to ask... Uh, Dennis and Frank, to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back first to Dennis Norden. Do not go gentle into that good night. If, when you're broadcasting, you mention a doctor, dentist, or lawyer, 
by name, you can do him an infinite amount of harm. I want you to listen to this name, Milton Mowbray. <laughs> He's my dentist. <laughs> I'll repeat it, Milton Mowbray. <laughs> and I hate him. <laughs> if any of you who are listening happen to live next door to the British Dental Association, bang on the wall <laughs> and tell them I'm saying Milton Mowbray. A little fat fellow is actually. He used to be a riveter, but he got scared of heights. <laughs> um, I went to him last July for my normal six months checkup and was sitting in the chair and he was doing the usual sort of peering down my gullet and I was doing the usual ho ha ho ha. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what you say when when the dentist says, you've got your mouth wide open, and he says, am I hurting you? And you say, oh, ha, ha, ha. And he went to look closer, and he took that thing that they use, which is a, like a long silver stem with a, a little round mirror at the bottom, and he put that in my mouth, and he put that other thing which takes all the spit out and goes glug, you know, that sort of <laughs> glucking noise that it makes. And he looked down into it and he said, Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Well, I thought he'd backed into the high-speed drill because he'd, <laughs> he'd done that before, you know. And um, I said, uh -huh, uh -huh. And... Um, he said, you have a cavity, a big, black, round cavity. I said, where? Or rather, eh. And, um, he said, your left upper canine. Well, I checked it up, because you know that sort of map of your mouth that they keep in the box file? Well, he always sort of lays that on my lap, and I looked at it, where the upper left canine was, and it's sort of like full throw along in the dress circle you know what I mean? <laughs> and he said oh dear he said let's look at the next one and he shifted along and he said oh dear oh dear oh dear he said you've got a cavity in that one a big round black cavity well I didn't believe him he shifted along to the next one he said you've got a cavity in that he looked at every tooth and found I had a cavity in every single tooth well, you know, I just couldn't believe it. I told him, I said, I, I don't believe it. <laughs> and he said, well, come up here and look for yourself, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it, it shows the brain power of the man. <clears throat> and I said, I can't have. He said, we'll have to have them all out. <laughs> Which he did. <laughs> I had them out, and of course, I didn't see him again after that, because I didn't have to, you see, anymore, and never will. I got a letter from him last week, and he said, Dear Mr. Norden, he said, uh, something amusing cropped up. He said, would you like being in the business of amusing? Might be interested, sort of. Because he's an illiterate oaf as well. <laughs> he? he said, um, you may remember I took all your teeth out. <laughs> he said, because of all them cavities. He said, well, I found something rather funny. He said, they wasn't cavities. It was a black speck on my mirror. <laughs> I'll repeat his name again. <laughs> Milton Mowbray. Any of you who are listening who may be in any kind of need of attention to your jaws, I beg of you, do not go dentally to that great nit. <laughs> <clears throat> I was going on Saturday to my own very nice dentist, and now I certainly shan't. And so we'll go back... back to mine now. <laughs> we'll go back to the second quotation, to Frank Muir. The fleas, the teas, in the high Pyrenees. Did I ever tell you when I was a pink slaver? <laughs> Which is like, like a white slaver, but I was rather sunburned. 
because it, 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 um, it happened in the south of France. It's about five years ago. Um, it all came about really because the, the children were much younger then. We had the two children and the three dogs. And my wife was a bit chocker. She thought she was vegetating and she just spent all her days shoving chocolate biscuits into expectant mouths and uh, grade A milk and then the children had to be fed as well. And she, she, <laughs> she, uh, she thought she wasn't doing anything useful, that she should get some kind of job. Now this I found absolutely riveting because I looked through the jobs vacant pages of the n newspapers and found that, that uh, boiler riveters were earning about 28 pounds, that steeplejacks mates were earning about 30 pounds. So I did my best to encourage my wife, you see, <laughs> in this very worthwhile endeavor. And she said, well, I can't leave the children and the dogs. We'll have to get some help. And I thought, well, my goodness, at 28 quid a week coming in, you know, we can, we can surely afford this. So I got into an agency which supplies these foreign girls and paid the fee. And after three, three months, and I paid another fee. And after three months, I paid another fee. And we got our first foreign help. She was a rather stocky German woman called Gerda. It's a, a pretty apt sort of name to have. <laughs> and she, was, she had a nice smile. She came with two cardboard suitcases. We opened the front door and she said, Guten Morgen! and walked through the front door, through the hall, out of the back door, and we never saw her again. <laughs> it was really a rather odd, because she would have had to climb a fence. Anyway, but she, she disappeared. <laughs> so we paid another fee. Another three months went, went by, and I was getting frantic. Still no job for my wife, because of this no help. And then we happened to spend these few days in the south of France, on our boat. This was the time when we had our canal cruiser. What happened was, we, we came out of the Regent's Park Canal <laughs> a bit fastish, and we didn't realise that the tide was going out in the Thames, and that at Ramsgate I turned left instead of right. Anyway, we, we arrived um, at Nice Harbour, and we were tied up there, and I got all pink uh, from the sunburn, and we used to have lunch at a little restaurant, and after two days, we were immensely taken with the hired help. Such a dynamo of energy. You should see her fillet a fish. Whack, whack, finished, you know. No wonder they say poor soul. And the... <laughs> all that she never stop for one moment. Do this, polish, clink, clink, clink. Table was laid. We thought, now, if only we could get her. And apparently she, she would love to come over because we offered her five shillings a week because she doesn't know English currency. And, she, and she, she would love to go, but she said that they worked her very hard there and they wouldn't, couldn't possibly let her go. Is there some way that she could escape from the hotel without being seen? So I laid this plan, this pink slavery of abducting this girl. And from the boat, I got a huge zip bag which we use for bringing on all the blankets and things, a huge sort of canvas valise thing which holds anything. And I carried that into the hotel. Then, at night, when we'd finished dinner, I said to her, you are coming to England with us. And I touched her lightly on the arm and she went, oh, <laughs> very jolly girl. Did I mention this? You only had to nudge her and she went off into fits of, hee, 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 Just like that, only fatter. And uh, I said, no, get in the bag and don't giggle. So she got in the bag and I just managed to zip her up. And my wife and I between us crept out of the hotel, it was by now dark, onto the quay of that harbour quay thing at Nias, and got into this tiny little dinghy to row out to our boat. Now, unfortunately, it's a very small dinghy, and a, a little bit of rocking happened, and I'm afraid that the, the bag, with the baggage inside, tumbled into the water. Well, naturally, there's no danger. I mean, she was so fat, she just floated there like a cork and bobbed up and down. <laughs> so, muffling my oars with my socks, so as nobody should hear, I rowed, sculled madly around and poked at this bag to try and bring it nearer. But, of course, this was fatal, because as soon as the, the oar touched her, there was, gee, <laughs> came out of the bag, and I was saying, tisez-vous, and be quiet, toi. And, and, and the, 
<laughs> other French expressions, but it was no good. There were the police, searchlights, people were crossing themselves, hiding the children's eyes, <laughs> seeing this curious sniggering noise from the bag, so immediately I rode quietly out of the searchlight, back to the boat, and left her there. And so we never did get our hired help, we're still poor. But it's so interesting that the last view we had of the spotlight of the police and the fire brigade on this bag bobbing up and down the water, sniggering in the harbour, one would think that this would just be forgotten. But no, it's obviously passed into Med Mediterranean myth. Because here, in Hilaire Belloc's poem, is a line which, with a poet's facility for words, exactly captures the scene. Do you remember the line? It's from the poem Tarantella, and it goes... The valise that tehees in the harbour at Nice. <laughs> well, it's interesting to remember that the penalty for kidnapping in France is the guillotine. Uh, and by your vote, Frank Muir wins the contest of the stories, but the final score for the whole contest is nevertheless that Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden win by three marks from Delis Powell and from Frank, and that also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norden, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Dennis Norton, and Frank Muir. Round one tries to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they get the meaning of the following words right. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Anne, what is a mask? M-A-S-Q-U-E. Mask. Well, it's some kind of a stage performance. Yeah, what kind? I think with music. Yes. A rather rhythmic, uh, music and... Movement. Movement. <laughs> Dancing. Well, at what sort of stage would, would you have found it? I mean, when, when abouts in our history was this popular? It's rather medieval, I would say, or mm. later. No, Elizabethans <laughs> went in for pageants. Right. There are a lot of religious masks, surely, which are earlier yes. than Elizabethan. That's quite true. <laughs> I think that's good enough, too. Um, the point is, it was amateur, um, dramatic and musical entertainment, originally entirely in dumb show, but later they added in verse speaking as well, mainly played by extremely sort of higher-up people, I mean, at court and so on. There was a mask of queens in which uh, one of the a real queen actually took part. Too much. Thank me. What is fever few? F e v e r f e w. Fever few. Uh, it, continental flu. Uh, <laughs> fever la France. Uh, <laughs> is there anything to do with febrifuge? Yes, you're on 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 beam. Well, febrifuge is a is a posset or drink which you take to reduce your temperature. Yeah. Uh, this is... What do you mean, yup? Yeah. 
Well, you might make it into a drink, but I, I wanted the uh, Dennis, original. Um, I think that... Uh, what would you <laughs> write in the book? Blank. <laughs> oh, plant. Yes. It's, a, it's a plant used for reducing French temperatures. All right. <laughs> Two marks. Quite right. It's a white flowered herb of the Aster family called pyrethrum, formerly used in medicine to cure a fever, and it comes from a Latin word meaning driving away fever. Dennis Powell, what is the meaning of germane? G-E-R-M-A-N-E. Germane. Um, it means um, related to or relevant to. That's good enough. Two marks. Pertinent to the point, and it comes, for, uh, as in the phrase, cousin German, um, people who belong to the same stock. Dennis Norton, yours is very different. What is a blither skate? Or you could call it, if you preferred it, a blather skate. But I I'll spell the first. B L E T H E R S K A T E. Blether skate. Blether skate. Well, it's something to do with a blether <laughs> skate. Blether could be short for black leather. <laughs> <laughs> In which case, a blether skate would be a. a a Turn up. motorcyclist Turn up, on ice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's a, I believe it's a Scottish word, isn't it? Yes. Ah, oh, <coughs> you blether skate. Yes, it's not complimentary. Not at all. It's an uncomplimentary Scottish word. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to find a bit more closely. Do you? Care. I mean, not half as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't think I can get... Can you something get to do with somebody talking rubbish, do you yes. think? Blather. Yes, blather, that's right. Yes, Somebody, somebody talks a lot of you're blather. You're a rubbish talker. That's absolutely right. A person who blathers, one who talks loquacious nonsense. I'm sure it's germane to this round. <laughs> the, uh, the Icelandic word for a journalist, ladies, is blethermeister. <laughs> I like that one too. <laughs> We're both speechless. <laughs> Well, before we start round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I want the two women members of the team to study their quotations, because at the end of the programme I shall ask them where those quotations come from. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden, here's your quotation. As I strolled along the Bois de Boulogne with an independent air, <laughs> and uh, Dennis Powell and Frank Muir, here's yours, it was roses, roses all the way. And at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their idea of how these came to be said <coughs> or written. And so on to round two, which is about legends and myths. Two marks, we get them right. Anne Scott James. Who was Pen Thesilea? Pen Thesilea. Haven't a clue, except it's Pen probably out of, the, out of Homer. Pen yes, it is. Oh, well, something they gave you when you have a tooth, dear. Who, not what? Oh. <laughs> what? He's a complete stranger. Achilles and Easter do you right. think? Achilles is, is getting very Something close indeed. Something to do with yeah. Achilles, yes. Uh, a chum. And not there's a lair, a female, though. A female, yes. Mm. His mistress, let's go for that. I give you, I think half is right, because there is an element of this into it that comes in to the story well, There always is, late. isn't there, Jack, unfortunately. Um, she was the queen of the Amazons and daughter of the god of war, Ares, and she, after Hector was killed, she fought with the Trojans and then had to meet Achilles in single combat and was killed by him. And while I'm giving the half mark, it's said that as she died, her youth and beauty filled the heart of Achilles with love. All right, Frank, now, who was Ceres? C-E-R-E-S. Goddess of corn. She's actually a goddess of everything the, the good soil produced when scarified, wasn't she? <laughs> it's a sort of harvest and the bounty of the good earth. <clears throat> Absolutely right. Two marks. Dennis Powell. Who was Bellona? B-E-L-L-O-N-A. Bellona. Something to do with war. Yes. Goddess of. Goddess of war. Yes. Which country? Uh, Rome. Yes, that's good enough. <laughs> Two marks. Bellona was the Roman goddess of war, <laughs> and again, with this rather sort of curious um, imprecision that one finds in mythology, some say she was the sister and some say she was the wife of the war god Mars. She might conceivably have been both, but that doesn't happen either. <coughs> um, all right, Dennis Norden. Who was Hermaphroditus? Oh, well, Hermaphroditus was um, half a lady and... Half a gentleman. Yes. Um, 
Other than, I mean, that, I think she sort of rested <laughs> on those laurels. Uh, it was enough for anybody to put up with her. It's quite a lot. Of course, but the put child of Hermes and um, that's right. Aphrodite. Oh, that's yes. right, yes. That's right. Named like that's a race, name. race horse. That's is right, named. yes. Yeah. Out of so and so, yeah. by so and so. But he didn't start quite as Dennis has described him, her, or it. He didn't. No. Them. Them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's his tough luck. <laughs> well, he started as one or the other, didn't yes. he? As a he. Mm. Started as a he mm. and ended up as a she. shim. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one and a half, I think. Good heavens. Um, We've named the mother and the father. <laughs> yes, but you missed the change this, of sex. Missed the mo most essential element in it. <laughs> uh, the son of Hermes and Aphrodite, which you got right, born on Mount Ida, he inherited the beauty of both his parents. And that so excited the nymph of the fountain Salmasis, which where he was bathing, that she prayed to the gods that she might be indissolubly united to him, and the request was granted. But the result was uh, something with the characteristics of both sexes. <coughs> so there you are. I think one and a half, sir. All right, on to another round. Um, these are foreign expressions which are in any rate fairly everyday use, and I want to know for two marks what they mean. Anne Scott James first. Alma Mater. Um, just means your dear mother or your mother country, usually. In your old school. Your That's old. it. That's Not better. necessarily, does it? No, it doesn't really mean that. You ought to know this one. If you'd been at a yeah. boys' school, it wouldn't be your mother, I wouldn't have thought. It's glory to her. All those... And what about yours? Oh, yes, I had an Alma Mater, but he had an Almos Pater. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work that way. Well, anyway, it'd be Almas. <laughs> I said Almas. Sorry, I, I, I apologise. Give her eight marks. Well, your, dear, your dear old school, and considering all the memoirs, school to boy memoirs we keep reading now, every single <coughs> boy hated his old school. Yes, it isn't only schools. Uh, anyway, to get to two marks, it means literally bountiful or fostering mother, but it's normally used um, of your own school or university. And you may have been happier there, Anne, with luck. Now, Frank Muir, meaning of the word entrecha, E-N-T-R-E-C-H-A-T. -E well, it's a French word which means between cats. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and this is due to, it, it's a balletic movement. It's a, it's a dance step used in ballet. Have you ever seen two cats fighting <laughs> and sort of uh, clawing round each other? Well, it, an entrecha, the, the dancer elevates his or herself slightly above the floor and makes with the legs like an egg beater. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm I'd, putting this for beginners. I'd give you your two marks. As Frank correctly says, it's a ballet step in which the dancer jumps up into the air and strikes his heels together several times before he lands with a flop again. <laughs> On to show. Dennis Power... Ex officio. Ex officio. Um, it means um, as part of your official job. You do, you do a thing... <coughs> yeah, give an example, could you? Uh, well, the Lord Mayor, ex officio, presides at the Mayor's banquet. Yes, he does, but he does that... Yes, I think that's near enough. It's not quite what I wanted, Dennis. It's not quite what you want. What else does I think he do? <laughs> Ex it's one of those things where the uh, we want for, they want to elect five members of the committee. The uh, <laughs> the vicar himself will, of course, take the chair ex officio. That's, it. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's exactly it. Yes. All right, you get your two marks. It means by virtue of the office that you hold, so that the ex officio members of a committee are on the committee, not as it were as people, but but by virtue of the official position that they hold. That's the difference between them and ordinary members. Dennis Norton, demi mondaine. Oh, that's much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> it means a lady of the half world. Yes. Um, I don't want to be explicit about this, really, Jack. <laughs> lady who believes nothing risque, nothing gained. Um, <laughs> yes, I you think know that what I'm getting at, Jack. Excellent enough, I think. I think that'll do this. Um, woman on the outskirts of society of doubtful or tarnished reputation, and as Dennis Wright says, a woman of the half world. Then a rather quickie round of literary odds and ends, two marks again. And Scott James, who wrote the following and to what was he referring? 
This time, it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of the tail and ending with the grin, which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. Oh, it was the Cheshire Cat. Very good. Disappearing by... in the tree by Lewis Carroll. And which of the two books? Alice in Wonderland. Yes, well done. <laughs> well done, Anne. Lewis Carroll, the Cheshire Cat, the Alice in Wonderland, Chapter 6. <coughs> Frank Muir, this is a quotation from Conan Doyle's Scandal in Bohemia. To Sherlock Holmes, she is always the woman. Who was always the woman? Uh, it, it was uh, Dr. Watson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> see, what isn't generally realised is that Sherlock Holmes thought Dr. Watson was a woman. <laughs> he was very short-sighted. It was partly due to the drugs. That's why he used to play the violin to her. And, and, and any uh, physiologist will tell you that um, brilliant deduction goes with this very, very acute, but very short-sighted vision. It's a splendid story, and it's utterly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you get no marks. It... The Queen? No, no, no. It's a, it's a, a character called Irene Adler and comes in Scandal in Bohemia. <coughs> Phyllis Powell, who was referring to what when he wrote, Thou light-winged dryad of the trees? Keats. To? Was referring to the nightingale. In? Oh, in the nice. tree. Ode to the nightingale. All right, you're there. The Two marks. Keats is owed to a nightingale. Um, thou light-winged dryad of trees in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless singest of summer in full-throated ease. And then on for quite a lot of lines after that. Dennis Norton. Between the dark and the daylight, when the night is beginning to lower, comes a pause in the day's occupations that is known as... The children's hour. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Dennis. And who wrote it? Well, I tell you who wrote the children it was... Um, it was a play by Lillian Hellman, and that was a preface to it. And originally? I don't know. I don't know who wrote that bit. It's Transatlantic. It's not a child garden of verses, is it? Tra Transatlantic. Well, who? Who? Longfellow? Yes. <laughs> uh, one and a half, I think. I helped a bit there. Um, the Children's Hour by Long, Longfellow, and then it's got it quite right. Comes a pause in the day's occupations that is known as the Children's Hour. Well, now we come to the last round, and we go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the programme. Two marks, and Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation? As I strolled along the Bois de Boulogne with an independent air. The girls, they all declare. It's a song my son used to sing when he was three, very loudly. <laughs> and I think it was originally sung by Charlie Coburn. Yes, it was sung by Charles Coburn, but the song was written by Fred Gilbert, and the title is The Man Who Broke the Bank at Monte Carlo, and this bit goes as I strolled along the Bois de Boulogne with an independent air. Dillis Powell, the origin of your quotation, which was, it was Roses, Roses All the Way. It's Browning, Robert name, Browning. Yeah. The name of the poem is The Patriot. Yes, well done. Robert Browning, Patriot or Patriot. It was roses, roses all the way, and flowers strewn in my path like mad. Or a sad poem, two marks. Well, now I shall ask uh, Frank and Dennis to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer amount of applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, back to Dennis Norden with his lines. As I strolled along the Bois de Boulogne with an independent air. I had a very humiliating and distressing experience in a cinema a couple of weeks ago. I'd gone in there to see a Japanese film called Am O Alko. <laughs> well, I, I thought it was a Japanese film called Am O Alko, but I, the poster was on the other side of the glass door. It was actually an American film called Oklahoma. <laughs> And I'd seen the film through, and I was g getting up to put my anorak back on, because my mother says, you must always take off your top coat or anorak when you're in a cinema, otherwise when you come out, you don't feel the benefit. <laughs> and I was just 
putting it on in my seat, stood up, and I bent forward so as not to obscure the view of the people behind me, because I do believe we should think of other people whenever we possibly can, and as long as it doesn't inconvenience ourselves. And I zipped it up, and I left. And the first intimation that something was amiss came as I passed the commissionaire, who raised his left hand, palm outwards, and said, how? <laughs> as one would greet a Red Indian. Musing on this, I strode along the Bowles Pond Road, <laughs> and so many people gazed at me with a strange, rather brooding expression that I glanced down at myself, <laughs> as chaps do. <laughs> And there, to my horror, suspended from the zip of my anorak, at about waist level, was a great tuft of ash blonde hair. <laughs> now, I realized what had happened when I stooped over and zipped up my anorak. The lady sitting in front of me must have been wearing one of those things which ladies affect these days, which is a, a, what they call a piece or switch at the back of her head. And I had zipped it into myself and borne it away down the Balls Pond Road. And here I was in the open Balls Pond Road with this thing hanging down from me like some kind of grotesque sporran. <laughs> Well, I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you felt a right nana. <laughs> because if so, you will appreciate the extent of my humiliation. I rushed back to the cinema and I rapped on the cashier's desk and I said, has anybody come out complaining that they've lost their hair <laughs> while watching the film? And she said, well, it's a long film, I admit, but it isn't that... And I didn't wait for her to go <clears throat> into explanations. I sped back into the cinema, got to the seat where I was sitting, leaned forward and very softly said to the lady in front of me, don't be alarmed, madam, but your bun is in my anorak. <laughs> now... I don't know what she thought I said. <laughs> but the trial has been put forward to the county assizes. <laughs> now, whatever the result of this trial may be, and whatever the humiliation I shall endure, I do assure you it will be nothing like the humiliation I endured as I strolled along the Rue de Bull's Pond with some independent hair. <laughs> well, I'm so glad Dennis has been allowed bail. <laughs> And now back to Frank Muir, if you remember, his quotation was, it was roses, roses all the way. My lord, <coughs> my lord, your lordship just asked me whether I have anything to say before he passes sentence, before you pass sentence. Well, your lord, I would like to take advantage of your kind offer and interpolate a few interjections at this junction. <laughs> My Lordship, you've heard the evidence about how on this foggy night I did climb over the wall of this lady's prison and approach a group of police officers with my pockets full of diamonds, rubies and emeralds which belonged to a shop that had just previously been broken into about a mile away. Uh, while you was talking at great length, my lord, and somewhat inaudibly, if I might say so, <laughs> I had a big think, and I've come to the conclusion 
that I want to spill, as you might say, the gaff. And whatever the sentence, my Lord, his infinite wisdom and generosity <coughs> giveth me, I will go straight afterwards because, quite frankly, my Lord, burgling is a mug's game. Because I realised, while he was droning on, my Lord, to the jury, that I'm an unlucky man. And luck, my Lord, you will admit, I believe, is essential to any profession, even yawn. Quite frankly, I'll be frank with you, if I may, my Lord, I did that job. Because fog is a wonderful thing to a criminal, my Lord, because you can't be seen, you see. Not with them big yellow globules, you just can't be seen. <coughs> and this jeweller's shop, as was mentioned by the detective inspector, I've nothing against <coughs> him, a kind man. I selected the jeweller's shop just off the Camden Hill roundabout there because of, of the fact that it has no steel shutter inside the window. Right. I arrived there in the fog, in the night, given in the evidence, and I flung my boot, <coughs> my right boot, <laughs> through the glass, my lord, and I snatched into my raincoat pocket the afore evidence given trinkets such as the tiara and the uh, that <laughs> necklace with all the emeralds and things, you see. Now, my lad, what I didn't realise was a boot, when flung through glass, can travel a considerable distance. <laughs> and whilst it is easy to pocket the aforesaid ice, if I may use the technical jargon, your lordship, you cannot then afterwards retrieve your boot. <laughs> This was, as it were, the first floor in my plan. It was where Dame Fate, that fickle jade, had really put the mockers on me. <laughs> because my plan was then to go through the fog to the tube station at Campbelltown, there mingle unnoticed with a home-going crowd. <laughs> I'd gone but four paces through the fog, and I suddenly realised that the loot, which was in my left-hand raincoat pocket, was getting smaller. Now, there's an hole in my left wing. <laughs> I could not expect your lordship to know, and I'm only divulging now. And this, this emerald necklace affair, I've broken the string, and I've been dropping little emeralds <laughs> all the way. So all it wanted was some bright alec up at Scotland Yard to go to the scene of the crime and just follow this trail of emeralds, and it would lead to me. So what could I do? Where could I hide? And suddenly I remembered... There was a mate of mine, I won't belabor you with his name, because it is not within my memory at the moment, <laughs> but he tell me, he tell me that there is a monastery just up the Seven Sisters Road, it's over a high wall, you see, and the, I, I can't remember the order, that is, they wear dark habits, he said, and, and they don't talk, but they give sanctuary to criminals, it goes by, right back to the medieval ages. So I went up the Seven Sisters Road, groping in the fog, limping, going up and down a bit because of my loss of boot. And I see this eye wall, and I get over it, and I see through the fog these murky figures all clad in dark blue, and I says to myself, Monks! Monks! Monastery! And that, my lord, is where my luck finally let me down because I walked into this well-known ladies' prison, <laughs> and they were, in fact, not blue-clad monks, but police constables. And that's why I'm going straight, my lord, because I can't face that sort of ill luck again when I think of it. I thought I was safe. Monks! Monks! Monastery! It wasn't, my lord! It was Rosas! Rosas! Holloway! <laughs> Well, I'm so much in tears, I can hardly see what the score is. But as I understand it, uh, Dennis Norden wins the contest of the two stories, and the final score is an extremely close one, because Anne Scott James and Dennis win by half a mark from Frank Muir and uh, from Dillis Powell. And that also brings to an end this edition of My Word. <laughs> In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.